Hello everyone, you're watching the channel Stories of Our Life. Friends, make yourselves comfortable. I wish you to truly enjoy listening to this life story. Cody was sitting in the meeting room and getting desperately bored. It even seemed strange that before all these meetings used to seem very important to him. Reports, figures, plans for the future, none of it seemed to matter now. Maybe it was the long absence from his two months in the hospital. There were a lot of things you looked at differently when you were one step away from death. He just couldn't wait to hear from one of the people present, the young sales manager, who was sitting in a chair with his leg over his head. He was smiling at every word of the speaker, and in the meantime was leafing through some pages on his phone. Actually, all the rules called for him to be reprimanded, but Cody kept silent. The information the manager go might be too important, and it was not worth spoiling relations with him over trifles. The girl sitting next to him peeked into his phone from time to time and even tried to flirt, but, to the manager's credit, he was unapproachable. If they'd started showing signs of attention right in the workplace, Cody would have had to intervene, but he didn't have the nerve or desire to discipline the youngsters. Adrian, Cody's deputy, meanwhile continued to finish his report, which no one cared about, citing figures, pointing out some shortcomings in the work that no one but him had noticed. Cody looked at him with pity. The old man was almost 70, but he was still the deputy he had been under the previous boss, Cody's father. Or maybe he had held the same position even earlier. Apparently, there was a category of people who were destined to be in the background forever, all their lives. At last, the most boring meeting was over. The staff began to leave. Only the manager, whose behavior had annoyed Cody for the whole hour, remained in place. They looked at each other. So, Cody asked curtly, is there any news? Did you get the information I asked for? The guy took a piece of paper out of the folder in a slow theatrical motion and shook it in the air. Of course, I did. Your doctor was unapproachable, I couldn't find out anything through him. But, as they say, the world is not without good people. If you look hard, there will always be informants. True, they asked for a lot of money. But you promised that all this spending is out of your pocket, so I agreed without haggling. You did the right thing, Cody nodded, don't worry about it. We'll talk about the money later. The most important thing is to tell me what's out there. You mean who, the manager clarified, look for yourself. It's some woman, that man's wife. Well, the donor who died for you. Cody glanced grimly at the manager and held out his hand for the sheet. Don't make jokes like that, he asked, it's disgusting to hear. All right, the guy replied with unprecedented humility, I won't. And anyway, what were you doing at the meeting, continued Cody, you were sitting around like you were at a party with your friends, laughing all the time, like Adrian was telling you something funny. What were you reading on your phone there? Jokes? Miguel, you're not in first grade anymore. How many times do I have to teach you how to behave? Shouldn't we call your parents to the school? Well, they're already here, aren't they, remarked Miguel slyly, at least half of them. Okay, Dad, no more. Read your papers. Cody unfolded the paper, and he didn't know what was happening to him. At the same time, he was both eager and afraid to find out whose name was on it. Ever since his heart transplant surgery, Cody had been burning with the desire to find out the name of his savior. But now, for some reason, he doubted his own idea. Wouldn't it be better not to reveal a secret that should be forgotten forever? He read the name written on the paper, and his new heart gave out for a moment. Both the donor and his wife, whose details were listed on the document, were not that he did not know. Cody could tell their entire biography about these two. Dad, aren't you feeling well, asked Miguel anxiously, should we call an ambulance? No ambulance, answered Cody irritably, do I look like a decrepit wreck who should have an emergency on duty all the time? You're not a wreck, but you look like a dead man now, the guy replied, what happened? Do you know these people? Cody shook his head, but then decided there was no need to lie, and confessed. Knew, even more than that. Once upon a time, almost 30 years ago, they were my friends. 
Actually, if Cody had uttered that phrase back then, he would have been laughing himself. Thanks to his parents' money, he already stood out among his peers, he got the best clothes, didn't know about the deficit, had his own car. Most kids couldn't dream of all that. Cody was almost indifferent to his studies, going to university only at his father's request. For some reason he believed that without the cherished diploma of education his son would not be able to take a decent place in life. Although his father himself had made it in life only through persistence and ingenuity. Cody suspected that not all of his father's activities were as legal and positive as he said they were. There had been some dark spots in his parents' biography. Yeah, and the times hadn't been the happiest. Most likely, his father had to make a deal with the law and his own conscience. Otherwise, he simply wouldn't have survived. In any case, he clearly had gotten the job of director of one of their city's largest enterprises for a reason. Cody preferred to stay out of it. He was satisfied with having money in his pockets, and nothing else mattered. Justin Becker was in the same group as Cody. But the guy was much less lucky. Or rather, he was just a total loser. There were no bright spots in his life. Justin came from a simple family, his father was some locksmith in a factory, his mother was a janitor. They had a son quite late, when they were both over 40, and lived modestly. And in the 90s, when things went bad, they started living in poverty. Becker's father was fired from the factory. He began to drink alcohol. His mother was exhausted, working two jobs. Justin only helped with his stipend. He never found any part-time work. He only tried to get a job as a longshoreman, but his mother wouldn't let him in the store. Always soft and quiet, she began to protest on this occasion. Dash, you'll ruin your back, you'll suffer the rest of your life. We'll get by somehow. We've been through so much before. You'd better study, build your future, and then everything will work out. Maybe father will be called back to work. Justin had to agree with his mother. However, the hope for the best was becoming more and more elusive. The factory where his father used to work was increasingly in decline. And soon it closed finally. Father wasn't looking for a new job. Then Justin realized that he knew what hell looked like, when you're hungry and your stomach is rumbling, you can't concentrate in class because all you can think about is sausage, and your luckier classmates are chattering away, talking about new clothes or Cody's car. Cody himself paid no attention to Justin, and Becker, the quiet honor student, grew increasingly jealous of his plight. Surprising as it may seem, Justin's envy was not malicious or black. He did not curse Cody at all, nor did he wish to crash his car. Becker simply wished for a little life or a sausage sandwich. At least that little something fate had to give him, if not for the sake of justice, at least out of pity. And it happened. Justin must have voiced his secret desire too often and loudly. Heaven did hear him. But Becker's dream came true in a rather peculiar way. Shortly before the summer session Cody realized that he was in a hopeless situation. His economics term paper was coming up, and he had nothing but a cover sheet. Normally, he knew just who to ask. His old lady, Scarlett, was always there to help. The girl had helped him out more than once, in simple seminars and even in exams, she gave him tips, let him cheat, even prepared papers for him, but this time she let him down. I'm sorry, Cody, please. It's my fault, Scarlett whispered, lowering her gaze, you know, I've been sick for a month. I have to do my term paper. I don't know if I'll make it. And the two I'm sure I cannot pull. Even if I sit in the library all day long. Too bad, Cody muttered in a thoughtful tone. It wasn't that he cared so much about his grades and his scholarship, which were often gone in one night, Cody would have got along just fine without it, it was his father who was the problem. He believed in the power of education, and, like in first grade, he kept an eye on his son's grades. It annoyed him terribly. Cody, who got into trouble with his term paper, had to find a way out. But what and where, he had no idea. Scarlett looked at his distraught face and felt a twinge of conscience. No one in the group did not suspect it, but the quiet and exemplary senior was in love with this guy from the first year. 
Opposites, as they say, attract. The girl found nothing better to do than to fall in love with a man who wasn't right for her at all. Maybe I should bribe the teacher, Cody thought aloud, but no, he's one of the old generation who shouldn't be offered money. That wouldn't work with him. Why don't we ask someone in the senior class, suggested Scarlett, the themes of the papers must be repetitive. Find out who had one similar to yours. Cody curled his lips thoughtfully. Then the girl gave her latest idea, which she just didn't have any better. What if you turn to Justin, asked Scarlett, he's a straight-A student. He doesn't even have a hobby. Maybe he would. Cody glanced at the straight-A student who was sitting at the other end of the classroom, working on a paper. They'd been at school together for four years, but it was like the first time Cody had really seen Justin. And no wonder. In his unfashionable outfit, the honors student blended in with the wall. The clothes he was wearing were three sizes too big. It was clearly someone else's old. Some old wrinkled pants, a gray, mousy sweater, it was at least ten years old. And Becker looked like a prisoner in a castle. He was pale, skinny, no wonder Cody never paid any attention to him. Do you think he'll agree to help me, the guy asked Scarlett, he looks like the ghost of communism. Those kind of guys have a hard time making contact. Justin is very nice, the girl interceded, just ask him nicely. I think if you call Justin a ghost of communism to his face, he'll say no. Try to talk to him like a human being. After pondering her words, Cody decided that the girl's idea made sense. Becker looked like a man who certainly needed the money. He wasn't likely to start wrinkling his nose and being principled, like the old professor. Cody approached the honor student a couple of days later in the hallway, picking what he thought was an opportune moment. Hi, he greeted Justin with exaggerated cheerfulness, as usual, who was curled up in a corner with some book. Why aren't you in the cafeteria? I thought they were splurging on meat pies today. Becker looked at him in confusion, then at his sandwich, which he was clutching in his hand. I've got my lunch with me, I brought it from home, the boy mumbled. To Cody's mind, this so-called lunch looked disgusting. The sandwich was a miserable slice, a mixture of bread and sausage cheese. Cody wouldn't dare try that, even if he had to starve for three days straight. Bon appetit, he said, trying to look friendly, listen, Justin, I have a job to do. Do you need money? At the word, money, Justin's eyes first brightened and then became even sadder than before. Obviously he needed money more than anyone else. You didn't have to ask. I could read it all right in the guy's face. Is there any work? Becker asked cautiously. Judging by the look on his face, the honor student didn't expect anything good from Cody, or thought he was being laughed at. He must have been expecting some kind of crime, an offer to deal drugs, for instance. Yes, there is, Cody confirmed, or rather, not even a job, but child's play. It's easy for you. Will you write a term paper for me? I'll pay you well. You won't be offended. He waited impatiently for an answer. Justin hesitated, he said neither yes, nor no. Inside Becker were clearly fighting two directly opposite desires, to make money and to send the rich son away for a long time. And who knows which one was stronger. After all, when did the honors students love the overachieving underachievers? What's the theme, asked Justin hesitantly. Cody exhaled in relief. If such questions had begun, then the case was, you might say, in the pocket. Now Becker would definitely agree. Justin did agree. If he had had any doubts at first, they were gone altogether after the amount Cody had quoted. Becker needed the money, at least to help his mother, and if he was not allowed to load crates of tomatoes, no one forbade him to do intellectual work. The student wrote this term paper before he finished his own. He was so impatient to make money. Cody did not cheat Becker, honestly paid him the full amount he had promised. Justin looked at the money and could not believe his eyes, his first salary was very big. His mother had earned a little more at school. Cody remembered the miserable sandwich he had seen in Justin's hands, and he was suddenly generous. 
Shouldn't we celebrate it at the cafe? He asked, I think the beginning of our collaboration promises to be successful. Justin's heart raced with excitement. A collaboration? It turns out Cody will be giving more orders. On the one hand, Becker was disgusted to be doing this. All his beliefs rebelled against such a thing, but on the other hand now, at least he could buy normal food for dinner and give something to his mother. She is poor. No gifts had come from him for a long time, not counting the children's drawings. Justin had matured enough and figured out life to understand, when the stomach is empty, a homemade card is unlikely to make her happy. Meanwhile, a philanthropist was awakening in Cody. Dash, we'll take Scarlet, too, he said, because she's always eating pie from the cupboard. She's as skinny as a chip. Doesn't get any vitamins. Scarlet, will you come with us? Of course, the headmistress agreed. She was shocked for a moment, but immediately nodded enthusiastically. With a good bit of imagination, this invitation could have been considered a date. And never mind that Cody had obviously invited her for nothing and Justin would be sitting at the same table with them. If a desperate girl wants to find love, she will see it in any movement or gesture. Walking these two to the waterfront cafe, Cody felt like either a do-gooder or a hen, showing the world to unintelligent chickens. Becker had clearly never been to one of these places and was as embarrassed as a freshman. Scarlett looked around as if she were in a museum. Cody led them to his favorite table and called out to the waitress. Jane, hi. Isn't Nellie working tonight? Of course, she is. She's here. She'll be right in, she said. The girl who approached them was the kind of person who made an impression on everyone, wherever and whenever they appeared. Justin blushed for some reason at her appearance and lowered his gaze. Scarlett felt uncomfortable too, but for an entirely different reason. She noticed the way Cody looked at the stranger. Meet the girl, he introduced her, this is Nellie, the best employee of the month, the year, and the millennium. Nellie, haven't they put you on the honor board at the diner yet? The girl smiled back. If it weren't for her waitress uniform, which fit her perfectly, the stranger might have been mistaken for an actress or a model. The luxurious black hair, fluttering out from under the barrette, the long eyelashes that Scarlett could only dream of. The headmistress bitterly thought that this girl might as well have been in adult films. With such a short skirt that the stranger wore, she would not even have to change. Nellie barely looked at these guests. All her attention was turned to Cody. It's been a while since you've been here, she remarked, her lips pouting capriciously, I thought you'd forgotten your way around our place. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Cody replied, we have more classes at the university than at your technical school. There's also a session coming up. I'm studying really hard. Don't break your teeth on the granite of science, the girl grinned, or how will we be here without you? She took the young men's order. Justin was so embarrassed that he pointed his finger at the first dish he saw. He ended up getting ice cream and tea. Scarlett ordered wiser, she searched the list for the cheapest, until Cody snatched the menu from the girl and ordered for her. It's my treat tonight, he reminded her, so there's nothing to think about to save money. You can have melted cheese another time. Not tonight. And who is this Nellie, inquired Scarlett, running her finger across the tablecloth, have you known her long? Three months, Cody replied, Nellie's a great girl. She's just unlucky in life, that's why she disappears in this place. She should work in a restaurant or a bank somewhere, but she has to run around in some cafe with ice cream and trays. She's not going to let her down here either, thought Scarlett. Unlike careless Cody, who absentmindedly did not see the flirting Nellie, headmistress noticed every gesture of the waitress, every flick of her eyelashes, which clearly indicated that she cared about this customer. Against her, Scarlett felt like a gray mouse. Competing with Nellie in beauty, she could not. This dinner lasted for ages for the headmistress and seemed a Becker moment. Justin seemed to fall in love with the pretty waitress at first sight. He didn't even notice he was eating. He kept his eyes on the slender figure flitting around the room. By the end of dinner, Scarlett felt as drained as a lemon. 
Cody wanted to invite his friends to a movie, but the girl declined. Thank you, but I'd rather go home, she said with a forced smile, I'm tired. I have a seminar to prepare for. Go without me. And what is Nellie studying for, Justin asked as the headmistress left, she probably chose something related to art, some kind of drawing, or maybe she is studying to be a musician at the conservatory. Becker didn't know much about culture. He just didn't have the time to do it, but he thought that such a gorgeous girl must be into something beautiful. Down-to-earth professions like accountant or salesman were clearly not for her. Cody laughed. You won't believe it she's studying to be a chemist. Really, she doesn't know any of those formulas at all. Wanted to be a designer, but she didn't pass any of the entrance exams. I had to go wherever they took her. Nellie's grandmother helped. A friend of hers at university asked her. So, shall we go to the movies? I hope you've done all your assignments for the week ahead. Not for nothing all the time sitting at the book. Justin did not dare ask any more questions. In his mind he knew that Nellie was no match for him. She was too beautiful, too risky, too brave, and they probably had nothing to talk about. You couldn't discuss economic theory with a girl like that. Justin's mind understood. But did his mind listen to his heart? On that warm spring day Becker had fallen completely and irrevocably in love. If he had known what kind of trouble it would lead to. In the end, Cody, who had once tried his hand at being a philanthropist, was gradually getting a taste for it. Justin was so shabby and pathetic that he absolutely had to be patronized. The first thing the guy decided to do was to dress up an excellent student. Perhaps without realizing it himself, Cody also had a personal interest in this. It was embarrassing to show up in public with Becker in tattered clothes. It seemed that everyone around him immediately wondered what these people had in common. Cody led him to his house and generously opened his closet. Take your pick, he said, take whatever you like. Justin shook his head panically. What are you doing? No. I can't do that. It costs a lot of money, which I don't have. Don't panic. I'm not asking you for anything, Cody grinned, I just want to dress you like a human being. You're the best student in the class, and you dress, excuse me, I won't even say who. I'm fine with it, Justin muttered, thank you. The whole situation embarrassed him terribly. The excellent boy had never been offered clothes before, unless you counted the things from distant relatives he had worn as a child. Cody nudged him toward the closet. Don't be shy, like a girl. Choose bravely. Half of these things are too small for me anyway. In the summer I'll go to the capital and update my closet. So take what you like. Some girl came into the room. Be more polite, brother, she remarked, who offers things like that? You should have said you were going to throw it all in the garbage. That would have made the man even more uncomfortable. Sorry, I wasn't thinking, Cody muttered, meet Justin, this is my sister Amber. She's three years younger than me, but she's very mean. Can pick on any word. The girl looked even younger, like she was 16 or 17. She was ridiculously dressed in the latest fashion and had mischievous bangs constantly falling over her eyes. Justin knew at a glance that he had to be careful with this person. It seemed that she was not as simple as she wanted to make herself out to be. A pleasure, the boy nodded. The girl looked at him with a mocking look and confirmed. Me too. So you're the Becker? The super brain of the whole group. I don't know about the super brain. I'm not sure, Justin muttered, but yes, Becker is me. A man like that just has to dress well, said Amber, and not in anything, like my brother thinks, but with taste. I'll help you. We'll find something together. The next half an hour, and it felt much longer, turned into torture for Becker. Amber really was just a girl, she found a new doll and began to play with it. Under the girl's guidance, Justin tried on almost half of the closet, and her brother watched it all and amused himself by making various comments. Becker, you're a real macho, he said, while the great boy alternately paled and reddened under Amber's onslaught. 
Justin, you could be in the movies instead of Bruce Willis. You look great. All the girls would be yours. I'm ready to fall in love with you myself, Amber echoed with a laugh, look out, brother, you've brought such a groom for me. And we'll introduce him to his father and see who impresses whom, Cody replied in tone with her, let's see, Justin, if you can pass the exam for the title of son-in-law. Passing it will be difficult for our father, I warn you. The high achiever was beyond happy when it was all over, and he was ushered out the door with a pile of new clothes. His mother, when he came home, was shocked. Justin, what is all this, she asked stunned, going through the stuff, where did it come from? Was there a sale somewhere? My friends gave it to me, replied the boy. He stared at the motley pile of clothes and couldn't believe it was all his now. Justin puzzled for a long time, unable to understand what he had in common with this rich family. Friendship? Perhaps. Though can you really call people who look down on you friends? After all, that's how Cody and Amber treated him. A little condescending, dismissive, as if they belonged to some other caste. And even though Cody had the best of intentions when he shared his clothes with the honor student, it had all turned into a masquerade. What do you do, Justin asked himself, take money for tests. Is that what real friends do? Also, Justin was irresistibly attracted to Nellie. Cody no longer invited his friend to the cafe, and the honors student was afraid to go there alone. He couldn't even imagine how he would order and talk to this girl. It seemed to him that the pretty waitress would just laugh at him. When he couldn't think of anything better to do, he invited Scarlett into the cafe. Why would that be, the headmistress asked, surprised, is it some kind of holiday I forgot about? No, confused Justin, just because. I got some money. Why not invite a close friend to dinner? Don't act like Cody, the girl replied, it doesn't suit you. Is he the only one who invites people to cafes, the guy asked, sorry, I didn't know. Scarlett looked at Becker's hurt face and took pity on him. I'm sorry, Justin, she said, sure, let's go if you want. I have nothing against it. It's just that the prices in this cafe are so high. Why spend so much for no reason? Justin had an excuse. But there was no way the guy would tell Scarlett about it. One girl is hardly capable of appreciating that she was invited somewhere just to look at another. The headmistress had some not very pleasant memories of her first visit to the place. And when she saw Nellie fussing in the hall again, her mood soured even more. Good afternoon. What would you like to order, the waitress asked as she approached them this time. There was no Cody in their company, so Nellie wasn't smiling as cheerfully. Becker even seemed to think the girl was upset about something. Take your pick, Justin said, holding out the menu to Scarlett, keeping his eyes on the charming cafe worker, I'll have whatever the girl chooses. He didn't even look at the headmistress. Scarlett shifted Justin's gaze to the waitress and understood. You know, I'm not hungry, she said, bon appetit, Justin. Thank you for the invitation and the attention. I hope you have a good time. Scarlett stood up, slung her bag over her shoulder, and headed for the door. Nellie and Justin followed her out with surprised looks. You have really a nervous girl, the waitress remarked, did I say something wrong? No, nothing like that, Justin protested, she's just not in the mood today. I probably shouldn't have brought her here. You shouldn't date girls like that at all, Nellie affirmed, they'll blow your mind in no time. And we're not dating, Becker replied, this is my classmate Scarlett. We're friends with Cody. Don't you remember us? The guy was shocked at his own insolence. He couldn't believe he was talking to Nellie, but he couldn't stop himself. Who knew if such an opportunity would never arise again? The waitress looked at him in surprise. Friends of Cody, she repeated doubtfully. Judging by the look that Nellie bestowed on the honor student, the girl deeply doubted that Cody could have such buddies. Three weeks ago on Friday, it was just the three of us, me, this girl who just left, Scarlett, and Cody, Justin said desperately. Nellie seemed to be starting to remember something. That's right. 
You were here, she said slowly, you were also wearing that retro gray shirt. Very original. Justin was upset that she remembered what he was wearing that day. On the other hand, he probably should have been glad that Nellie had paid attention to him at all that time. Young lady, will you join us, the waitress at the other end of the hall called, we've been waiting for five minutes. She looked at Justin impatiently. So, what are you going to order? Hurry up and tell me. The honors student's visit to the cafe went off without much success. He couldn't really talk to Nellie and took solace in the fact that he had just met her. Justin thought she had gotten prettier since the last time they had met. The next few times Becker came to the cafe only with Cody, and of course he couldn't even hope that Nellie would dignify his attention. The girl was flirting with Cody and didn't care about the rest of the world. Justin was so upset that he could barely hear what they were talking about. Cody seemed to be calling the girl to some party somewhere. Are you coming, he asked his friend. Justin was at a loss for words. Where to, he asked. Gee, said Cody indignantly, I've been telling you about it for hours. To the end of session party. Are you going or not? Becker still didn't understand anything. Cody sighed heavily and repeated the explanation. Zess has invited the whole group, you included, to his country cottage by the river. It's not exactly convenient to get there, but I have a car, so there's no problem, I'll give you a ride. Okay, I'll go, Justin replied. There was no doubt that the honors student had only been invited to the party because of his friendship with Cody. In any case, Justin had never noticed such attention to his humble persona before. Nellie will be there, too, Cody added. And that settled the matter. Now Justin would walk there, he would do anything to see the girl again. Before he left, Cody winked at the waitress and kissed her on the cheek. You what? The boss will see, she laughed. Let everybody see, Cody replied, see you Sunday. The boys left, and Nellie returned to the kitchen. Her friend Jane greeted her with a questioning look. How did it go, she asked, is there any news? There is, replied Nellie cheerfully, Cody invited me to a student party this Sunday. The river, the music it will be so romantic. What romance? What are you talking about, responded Jane negatively, if it were just the two of you, I can understand that. But dancing in a crowd of people is kindergarten. You might as well have been smiling at Cody here in the hall. Besides, there'll be plenty of girls at this party, and it's not even certain that you're the one he'll be dancing with. He'll be with me, Nellie assured her, be sure of that. I'll take care of it. Jane was not convinced by these words. She was a few years older than her friend, and had seen enough sense in her life. Or, to put it more simply, cynicism. It's okay, even if it doesn't work out with Cody, you'll find another guy at the party, she said, there'll probably be someone to choose from. Why do I need someone else if Cody is the best? He's the coolest, and he's also loaded with money, her friend sighed. Okay, then fight for your happiness. Don't lose it, they were quiet for a while, and then Jane exclaimed, here's an idea. What if you pay attention to his shabby friend? Nellie wrinkled her nose. On Justin? Are you out of your mind? What do I need him for? You may not need a scarecrow like that as a boyfriend, but you'd be fine as a tool to achieve your goals, Jane winked at her. What goals, asked Nellie irritably, what are you talking about? I want to help you, silly, answered her friend in an obedient tone, you know what turns men on the most? The thought of having a rival. It's a kind of excitement. Now Cody walks around quietly, thinking that you don't have anybody and you're his property. Why then should he try to win you over? And you pretend he's wrong. Pretend you like Justin. You'll see how it changes. If Cody finds out I like his shabby boyfriend, he'll think I'm crazy. Did you see what that guy was wearing today? He's wearing some fake Cody's shoulder puffs. I've seen that shirt on him before. Seems that Justin has nothing of his own and only lives on handouts. I'm ashamed to even pretend to like a guy like that. 
Pick someone else, Jane shrugged, and yet, if I were you, I'd go with that option. You don't have to work very hard to charm him. Haven't you noticed that he eats you with his eyes? He's just a lure, and he'll be all yours. Actually, I have, a Nelly murmured, but he's so nasty. I can't even imagine kissing him. Who says you have to kiss him, Jane wondered, just flirt with him. That'll be enough. You'll see. I know the type, typical losers. He'll be happy for the rest of his life if you pay attention to him. Nellie thanked her friend for the idea and went to work. Justin was no picnic, a stubby, bespectacled guy, a typical straight-A student from the movies. Normally a girl would be ashamed to walk down the street with him, but for a lofty cause she was ready. Nellie smiled at her reflection in the mirror. The girl liked the idea more and more. She was confident of her victory. Justin, on the contrary, the closer Sunday was getting, the more he panicked. At first he took a very long time to choose what to wear. For the first time in his life he stood in front of the mirror for hours, like a girl, and tossed things aside in irritation. Everything was wrong. Something was hanging on him in a bag, something didn't match the color, and also all these things used to belong to Cody. It was humiliating for the student to have to go out with a girl and wear his rival's things. That was the first time he thought of Cody that way, and he was immediately ashamed of his own thoughts. After all, his friend had helped him wholeheartedly, had pulled him out of the mire of life, had shown him how interesting and multifaceted life could be. And this is how he, Justin, repaid it. I'm a freak, said the honors student to himself, don't even think about Nellie. That girl is not for you. Having made this noble decision, Becker wasn't so much relieved, but still calmed down a bit. It was time Justin got used to the fact that this world wasn't made for him. Lucky in friendship, already good. And if he was lucky in work, it would be even better. Why dream of anything else? To end up bitterly disappointed? On the day the party was scheduled, everything went awry from the start. Justin's mother received a call to work at the cafeteria where she worked as a janitor, the shift attendant had fallen ill and needed her help. Justin's father, left unattended, immediately decided to have a drink. Sunday's off to a great start, he winked at his son, it's easier to breathe at home without my wife. Dash, daddy, it would be easier to breathe at home if you drank less, Justin admonished him. What's all this drinking for? Dash, you're not old enough to teach me, replied the man. What's the fashion? You kept silent and silent, and then all of a sudden your voice came out. You're not afraid of me anymore. You dressed up like a dandy and think you can do anything? You're remembering some nonsense. And you're the smart one. You're dressed up nicely and think you can do anything? I shouldn't have whipped you with a belt. Justin realized too late that he had crossed the line. His father came at him with his fists, and the poor honor student had to run away from him into the hallway. The doorbell rang just in time. Becker opened the door and almost fell into the arms of Cody. He staggered back in amazement. What's going on? Father Justin raced after him, as furious as a raging bull. It was not a pretty sight. A drunken man in a stretchy t-shirt and sweatpants was the typical image of an alcoholic. And the shout he let out could in no way inspire enthusiasm in the casual visitor. I'm going to get you anyway. Cody reacted instinctively. He had boxed for a while during his high school years, partly at his father's insistence, partly out of personal interest. Who at his age wasn't into fighters? Cody's practice was long gone, but his instincts remained. He shoved Justin aside and punched Becker Sr. He immediately collapsed to the floor, sat up, clutching his heart, flapping his lips like a fish pulled out of water. You're dead, he kept threatening his son, just come home. Who is he? inquired Cody, looking at the man frightened, Justin. Didn't your parents teach you as a child that you shouldn't let the first person you meet into the house? The honorable man nodded dejectedly. Yes, they did. That's the only parent. That's my father. He shouldn't have been allowed anywhere. He lives here. 
Justin was so humiliated to admit that this alcoholic stinking of booze was his father. But there was no way out. How else to explain such a situation? Besides, there shouldn't be any secrets between friends. Father, wondered Cody, sorry, I didn't know. Bad luck. Like everything else, Justin agreed. His father continued to sit on the floor, sighing. The high school kid whispered anxiously to Cody, he'll be fine. The latter shrugged his shoulders. What could possibly be wrong? He'll be fine. From the look of him, it wasn't the first time this had happened to him. Actually, Justin's father had never been in a fight, unless you count assaulting his wife and son. But the honorable man didn't argue. Perhaps it was such a cliché, all alcoholics were automatically recorded as bullies, and in principle, his friend's assumption was not far from the truth. Well, shall we go, Cody asked as if nothing had happened, we'd better get going or we'll be late. All the pretty girls will be taken and there won't be anyone left for you, maybe just Donna from the finance department. Justin blushed. Donna wasn't considered pretty at all, and she'd never had a string of admirers. Still, the honor student had little faith that she could pay attention to him. He did not think that any girl at all would pay attention to him. Worst of all, deep down, he dreamt of Nellie. If only his friend knew about it. Once in Cody's car, Justin asked a childishly naive question. Was it hard to learn how to drive? Cody looked at him in surprise. Not really. A hundred times easier than all your advanced math. Haven't you ever tried it yourself? The high school student shook his head ashamedly. He didn't have a chance to drive, and he didn't have anyone to drive with. His parents had never owned a car. The only transportation Justin had ever driven was a horse harness to a cart. And that was back in his childhood at his grandfather's place in the country. That's okay, Cody said cheerfully, we'll teach you. After what he saw in Becker's apartment, the boy was even more transfixed by nobility. And let Justin did not look the slightest bit like a beautiful princess to be rescued from captivity, to live the way the honors student lived was unthinkable. Even to exist there was unreal. What was one alcoholic beating his son? Really, Justin asked hopefully, that would be great. Although I don't believe I can do it. They've taught more than that, responded Cody, who had never taught anyone to drive in his life, not even his sister. Becker continued to stare excitedly as if he'd gone to Disneyland instead of a foreign car. Then Justin noticed his reflection in the mirror and groaned. What else happened, inquired Cody, keeping his eyes on the road. I guess I can't go to the party, Justin said in a dropped voice, look at my face. Cody looked at him with a dismissive look and turned away. Normal face. Two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Yes, but I've got a bruise, Justin muttered, is it decent to come to a party dressed like that? Have you forgotten where we're going, grinned Cody, to the cottage. Nobody knows about decorum there. Besides, that bruise makes you look like a fighter. Nobody knows where you got it. Yeah, Becker sighed, I got it at home from my father. Who knew what I was up to? You should have hit him harder, replied Cody, don't squeeze the little ones. You're the smartest head in the university. If something had happened to you, what would we have done? Justin had other things to worry about. He suspected that when he returned home he would find not hugs, but more blows from his father. There was plenty to be upset about. For now, though, he had his first-ever student party ahead of him a few hours of fun and Nellie. He decided to put the unpleasant thoughts to rest and stop all thinking. We only live once, the guy encouraged himself. Maybe he'll be all right. Let's pick up Nellie and get out of town, Cody winked, we'll be there soon. At the mention of the girl, the honors student's heart began to race. And when she herself gracefully got into the car, he almost lost his senses. Changing the uniform of a waitress in a summer dress, Nellie became even more charming. Hello, everyone, she smiled, and then immediately became frightened, what happened to your face? I bumped into a joint unluckily, Becker muttered. 
He's lying, added Cody, those are war wounds. Our Justin got in a fight with some guy, can you believe it? No way, horrified Nellie, keeping her eyes round with surprise, Justin, is that true? The boy didn't know what to answer. On the one hand, he had always been taught that it was wrong to lie, but on the other hand, when a girl like that looks at you, how can you tell the truth? Justin nodded. Nellie shook her head. What horror. Does it hurt much, the girl reached out to touch Justin's bruise. He moved sharply away from her. I'd almost forgotten about it. Why are you shaking him like he's a little boy, asked Cody irritably, Justin's a real man. Wounds like that are nothing to him. Are you jealous? asked Nellie with a smile. You imagined it, muttered Cody. Still, the girl kept smiling. It seemed to her that Zoe's plan was working as it should. They were one of the first to arrive at the cottage. While Cody was choosing a spot to park the car better, Nellie invited Justin into the house. Shall we go see what's on offer here, she called out. What do you mean, Becker didn't understand? I mean menus, silly, she laughed softly, I work in a cafe. Have you forgotten? Justin had indeed completely forgotten that, how could such a girl work as a waitress if she belonged in the theater? Nellie didn't go to their university, but that didn't stop her from feeling very comfortable at the party from the very first minutes. Justin himself didn't know half of those present, and the girl greeted everyone and smiled. There seemed to be representatives of almost every university group here. They were celebrities, beauties, athletes, and members of student activities. There weren't any excellent students like Becker. For a long time, Justin couldn't figure out how he miraculously ended up in this company. And then he finally figured it out. It was all thanks to Cody. There was no other explanation. How could the star of college basketball have miraculously thought of the humble honor student? Unless Justin had missed the ball in some class that promised to bring their team victory. Nellie immediately discovered the kitchen in this house. What are you going to drink, she asked Becker, showing off the bottles, beer or should we start with champagne? I don't really drink, Justin would start, but under Nellie's mocking gaze he changed his answer, let's have a beer. They each took a bottle and walked to the living room. Francis' father was in charge of some kind of warehouse, so there was plenty of everything in the house. One beer alone, the guy stocked several cases. Justin, who had been discouraged by his father's sad example, was desperate to figure out what to do with the loot. He did not want to drink. Maybe he could pour the bottle unnoticed under a bush? Judging by the abundance in the kitchen, the landlord would obviously not be impoverished by such an action. And it would allow the nerd himself to keep his head sober. She was already going round and round from the presence of a pretty companion. Nellie looked at him and smiled. Well, tell me about yourself, she commanded, we hardly know each other. Justin couldn't figure out what was required of him. The guy was drunk with no wine. Maybe tell Nellie about the last conference he spoke at? But the girl wasn't likely to be interested. She should have thought of something more interesting. As luck would have it, Becker's head refused to think. For better or worse, Amber came to the rescue. Hi, she said, where's my brother? Weren't you supposed to come with Cody, she turned mostly to Justin. For some reason Becker sensed at once that the girls couldn't stand each other. He's outside, Justin answered, and he's staying with the car. How did you get here? With friends, Amber replied, continuing to look at Nellie sideways. Amber thought he caught the look of surprise that flashed in her eyes. It was as if the girl couldn't understand how the two were together. Justin rightly decided that the best thing to do in this situation was to continue making small talk. How on earth did you get in here, he asked, I thought Cody said this party was only for fourth graders. And yet other people are here, too, Amber said, giving Nellie a mocking look, anyone can get in if they try. Well, I'll leave you to it. Have a good time and all that. She grinned again and left the room. Nellie looked after her with hatred. Becker had never seen her like that before. 
The girl's beauty had somehow faded, distorting the grimace of her pretty face. Justin gently touched her shoulder. Don't get so upset, he murmured, Amber is still too young. She doesn't know what she's saying. Little Ogrin Nelly, Cody said she was 19. Is she an infant? Still, Amber was wrong, Justin insisted, why is she so mean to those who go to technical school? Chemistry is a very difficult science. I doubt I could study in such a field. But you could, Nellie smiled and lowered her gaze modestly, you know I'm studying chemistry? You've been looking for information about me? Then how interesting. Becker did not understand exactly what he said wrong, but for some reason also blushed at that moment. That's what Cody found them, all sweaty and irritated. There you are, he said, already found a beer somewhere. Good friends. Nothing to say. I'm over there swallowing dust in the heat, I can't find a shady spot for my car, and you're here resting. I'm afraid I wouldn't be much help, remarked Nellie, and neither would Justin. We're real slackers in this sort of thing, said the girl, taking Becker under her elbow. Though there was plenty of room on the couch, she moved even closer. Justin thought he was about to blow steam out of his ears with embarrassment, but Nellie didn't care. Becker couldn't figure out what she was up to. Give me that, said Cody, taking the bottle from Justin, it's not good for you anyway. Why's that, Nellie didn't understand, and the great guy blushed even more. He thought his friend was alluding to his father, if Justin tasted beer at least once, he would become an alcoholic. Cody sank back in his chair and stared frowningly at the bottle. Guests were bustling around, the house was crowded, someone turned on the speakers, music was playing, and Nellie pulled Becker by the arm. Let's go dancing, she called to him. At this point Justin couldn't find anything to lie about and had to tell the truth. I'm sorry, I don't know how, he muttered. Then let's see the garden, said Nellie, come on. Look, everyone is having fun all around. Why are you so boring? Justin had to relent and followed Nellie. When he looked back at Cody, he managed to notice that his buddy was still looking at the bottle. Something strange was going on, but Justin, who was used to walking around with books more than people, didn't know how to act. The couple walked away. And Amber immediately took the vacated seat and reached for the bottle of Nellie. Cody slapped her on the arm. Don't touch it. Why? Are you afraid Nellie will be offended? That way she probably won't be back for a while. But you're right. It's not worth it to try anything after her, you'll catch some kind of disease. I'd better go get some lemonade. She got up and was about to leave when her brother's voice stopped her. What's going on here, anyway, he muttered, I don't understand. Here, Amber interjected in surprise, the most boring and tasteless party I've ever been to is starting here. Why? Cody shook his head. That's not what I mean. I mean them, he pointed vaguely in the direction where Nellie and Justin had gone. It's very clear. Have you seen the way Justin looks at her? Like a puppy in love with his mistress, Cody continued to stare at her perplexedly, and Amber had to put it even more bluntly, he likes Nellie. Don't you see that? Who likes who? Justin, Cody wondered, Becker's an academic. What other girls? Are academics equated with monks these days, queried Amber, Becker's a regular guy, and Nellie's a regular girl, which everyone has a bunch of working girls. I don't see any surprise that Justin fell in love with her. I mean, he's such a simpleton. Cody looked around and looked at the crowd, as if expecting to see a couple kissing there. I don't believe it, he muttered, Justin never told me about liking anyone. I wonder why, muttered Amber, settling back in her chair. Okay, if you're such a psychologist, explain one more thing, Cody kept up, Justin likes Nellie. So be it. But what does she see in him? He's not a groom, he's a misunderstanding. Amber shrugged. I don't know about that. Maybe her maternal instinct kicked in. Suddenly she suddenly wanted to take care of someone. Or maybe she wanted a change. I wouldn't be surprised. 
What if Justin was just Nellie's type and she fell in love with him? What a joke that would be. But Cody didn't want to laugh at all, the guy was just seething with anger, imagining Justin laughing behind his back. He'd first gained his trust, made a pitying face, taken the clothes, and now he was targeting the girl, too. So you should do good to people after that. You'll make a fool of yourself. Cody stood up. I'm going for a walk in the yard. Don't beat Justin, Amber warned him, that guy's a real crank. He's the most harmless creature in the world. What can you take from him? Who's going to beat him, replied Cody. Well, don't, said the girl, admonishingly, and don't drink anymore. You're already a little rabid tonight. And who knows what's on a drunk's mind? Cody didn't protest. He didn't have much of an appetite anyway, he wasn't hungry or thirsty anymore. He strode out into the garden, looking for Nellie's bright dress. She was nowhere to be seen. But there were plenty of couples hugging and laughing, and each one made Cody's teeth gnash. The boy feared that he might find his friends in exactly the same way. What would he do then? In some ways Amber was right. Hitting Becker was the last thing to do, but Cody couldn't let such a betrayal go unpunished either. Justin knew perfectly well that he liked Nellie, that they could be said to be a couple. And yet he still got into their business. So how to punish him? The garden didn't turn out to be very big. Cody found the couple pretty quickly. They found them by an old apple tree. No, they weren't kissing, but they were standing so close together that Cody wanted to beat Becker with something heavy. Nellie laughed the whole time. That was the worst part. Usually the girl laughed so hard at his jokes. If Cody knew what it was costing her now. Justin couldn't think of anything better than to pull out some interesting facts about tree bugs butterflies and birds and initiate the girl into them. Nellie was just dying of boredom, but had to follow the course of his reasoning and feign lively interest. A tit eats 300 caterpillars in a day. Wow. What are you saying, she asked, yawning, I never would have guessed that. From her attention Justin found the strength to speak further, and the girl laughed at him like a fool. Noticing Cody walking down the walkway, she grabbed Becker's arm. Look, a butterfly, whispered Nellie, how beautiful. Do you happen to know what it's called? Of course Justin knew and was happy to share this information with the girl. Nellie didn't listen to what he was saying and kept a surreptitious eye on Cody. He stood in the distance, looked at them, and went back inside. The girl's heart raced with excitement. Had their plan not worked? Becker continued to say something excitedly, but Nellie was annoyed by the very sound of his voice by then. She smelled a kind of smugness in him, as if the honor student thought she was in love with him with no memory. Naive fool. He was imagining things. Do you know which bird is the least common in our area? Asked Justin, it's even listed in the Red Book. I know. The white crow, the girl replied sadly, letting go of his hand, Justin, I'm sorry, but I have a headache. I'd better go inside. The excuse was the stupidest. Because the music in the house was blaring. It couldn't get any easier in there. However, Nellie didn't care anymore. She just wanted to keep Justin. And no matter what the cost. She didn't need Becker anymore. Let him think what he wants of me, the girl thought with irritation, he's a miserable honor student. Nellie returned to the house and began to look for Cody. It was not easy, because during her absence the rooms had become more crowded. She went to the couches where she had last seen Cody, but all she found was his sister, flirting with some guy. Nellie didn't even think to ask her anything. It was clear enough how Amber felt about her. Finally, the girl found who she was looking for. Cody turned up in the kitchen. He was chatting with some blonde and paid no attention to Nellie who appeared in the doorway. She froze, unable to move. The stranger who smiled at Cody was very pretty, almost beautiful, and the clothes she wore looked more expensive than the mass-market clothes Nellie wore. Whoever this blonde girl was, she was winning in looks. The girl felt tears come to her eyes in frustration. She thought Justin was a fool, and she was even more foolish. 
she had hoped for a plan that had only made things worse. She didn't want to linger there. There was no point. Cody was busy anyway. Without looking around anymore, she headed for the exit. Someone called out to her, trying to stop her, but Nellie paid no attention to anyone. Hey, where are you going, smiled the owner of Zessa's house cheerfully, blocking the girl, why are you running and fussing? How about dancing with me? I'm inviting you. Nellie shot him a demeaning look. Look at yourself in the mirror. Let me pass, she shoved him aside and dashed out the door. Nellie didn't care that Zess had lots of money, a summer house, and useful connections. At other times she would have called herself an idiot for that. But now the girl didn't care. She felt in love with Cody, and no other guys existed for her. Finding herself on an old country bus among someone else's shopping cart bags, Nellie let her tears flow unashamedly from the other passengers. Everything was awful. Instead of a cheerful holiday at the cottage, she was met only by Becker and the burish Amber. And now she was forced to ride in a miserable bus. Apparently, her future life would not be boring and hopeless. Her mother, who opened the door to her apartment, greeted Nellie with surprise. Dash, my god, my daughter, what's wrong with you, she wailed, your mascara's all runny. Have you been crying? It's none of your business, the girl snapped, go to your room and don't eavesdrop. I need to talk to Jane. Nellie immediately rushed to the phone and started calling her friend. She turned out to be surprised by the call. Dash, Nellie, she muttered, why are you calling? Aren't you supposed to be at the cottage right now? But someone gave me the genius advice to charm Becker. Yeah, well, I may have charmed Justin, but I lost Cody. How's that for a turn of events? Lost, asked Jane, bewildered, I don't understand. Don't shout, explain in order. What happened? What happened is that while I was wasting my time with Justin on your advice, Cody found someone else, Nellie sobbed, some blonde with long legs. They're probably out there dancing together right now. Where are you calling from now, her friend wondered. I'm calling from home, Nellie moaned, I took the bus and left, because I couldn't bear to look at it all. What a stupid thing to do, her friend said quietly, staying there, you could have had some effect on the situation. And now you don't even know how they ended up. I don't know, but I can imagine, replied the girl, and I have no desire to witness it, believe me. I think Cody is just getting back at you, Jane said, he's jealous of Justin, and he's getting back at you. There's a reason for all this. It means he cares about you. Nellie doubted that very much, but other people's consolations were like balm to her soul. The girl sniffed her nose and asked, Do you think so? I'm sure I do, replied her friend, so be patient. Still, Nellie was very worried, thinking she had crossed the line. She should have listened to Jane and got herself into this adventure. Everything was going so well, and because of some excellent student had gone wrong. She shuddered, remembering her hand in his. Nellie remembered the two of them standing under the tree, and the past was seen in the blackest colors. The honors man's hand was weak and weak. And he himself was the ugliest guy in the world. Nellie could not indefinitely blame herself and found the ultimate becker. He was the one who had put the black cat between her and Cody. He was the one who had come on to her at the party and wanted to seduce her. The girl pondered all this for so long that in the end she believed her own fabrications. The scapegoat was found. All that remained was to prove to the world that this was it. The next morning, she arrived at work tired and teary-eyed. Jane, seeing her friend, said, You look terrible. Thanks for the compliment, Nellie muttered, I've been up all night. You know, I think you're exaggerating the problems, said her friend, you sound as if you're upset about Cody. Aren't there other men in the world? There are, but he's the one I want, said Nellie stubbornly. Well, stop crying, then. Do you think anyone would like that puffy face? My grandmother looks better. And she's in her seventies. Nellie powdered her nose and somehow got to work. She wasn't in the mood. Nor did she have the strength to smile. 
And when, toward evening, Jane came into the kitchen and told her that Cody the girl had come into the cafe, she was horrified. What do you think he wants, she asked Nellie, frightened. I don't know. Go find out, maybe he just wants to order a steak with blood and dinner. It's not on our menu. Fine, you can't hide forever anyway. On trembling legs, she headed for the lounge. Cody didn't look in the girl's direction, and it was as if he didn't even suspect she was approaching. Nellie walked over to the table and mumbled uncertainly. Hi. Cody looked at her silently. The girl was finally confused. I guess we're really over, thought Nellie, maybe he'll get mad at me for what happened at the cottage yesterday. The girl looked around to see if anyone had noticed her oversight and asked differently. What will you order? The guy laughed, but in a cold, mirthless sort of way. That laugh gave Nellie the creeps. Why so harsh, asked Cody, as if the inspector had come. You should have offered a book of complaints after that. Nellie suddenly became bolder. She was worried, she had not slept at night, and the insolent man sat up and laughed. She decided to go on the offensive. And you noticed? You come in here and act like you don't know who you are. And what was that yesterday? You brought me to the cottage, and you were smiling at some girl. You shouldn't have called me then, since you've got someone else there. I have another, Cody staggered, and who was with Justin and flirted with him. You took him to some unknown place. You started it. Nellie feigned resentment. Is that what you think of me, she said, you don't say. That's very nice. I just wanted to ask Becker what you'd like for your birthday. It's your birthday in two weeks. Already forgot, Cody looked at her in utter confusion. Nothing like that had really occurred to him, and Nellie, pleased with the effect she'd had, decided to add, by the way, Justin was getting his hands dirty, too. He imagined things about himself and started hugging me. I always thought that you would come to my aid in such a situation. But you just ran away. And not just run away, but to some girl. Trust a man after that. Nellie felt herself starting to cry again. She really believed what she was saying. The whole world was to blame for the girl's troubles, but not her. And the main culprit was now sitting here, at the cafe table. And it did not matter what the other customers of the cafe thought about what was happening. What mattered was that Cody himself looked at her with almost horror. He stood up and hugged the girl. Well, I'm sorry, it's just that you were smiling so much at Justin that I thought. What do I need him for? He's just pretending to be nice, and all he has in mind is nothing but vulgarity. Cody hugged her for a while, and then he asked her, Why don't we sit together, and then I'll take you home? I don't even know, Nellie said hesitantly, looking around the kitchen, if the boss sees? Jane waved her hand reassuringly. It's all right. Nellie bravely shook her head. So much so that strands of her hair were loose from behind her barrette and danced down her shoulders. And let everyone see, she said, even let them fire me if they want to. That's not all that matters. It's probably just little things. What if it turns out to be the last day of my life, and I spend it with a tray? It would be a shame. It won't be, the boy assured her, I promise. Nellie sat at the table, squeezed Cody's hand and sighed this time from happiness. Somehow the girl was sure that she had got her way now, Cody belonged to her completely. She wouldn't make any more mistakes. There was only one problem that troubled Nellie's soul, Becker. The girl didn't want this man to keep fidgeting around her and Cody. And somewhere in the back of her mind she was afraid that the honor student would say some nonsense, that would destroy the hard-won happiness she had built. She had to get rid of Justin by all means. You will avenge me, won't you?" she asked Nellie, looking at Cody with a pleading look. I will, Cody promised. Though he had no idea exactly what he was going to do. Actually, he had already gotten his revenge on Becker, in his own petty way just by not picking him up from the summer house and leaving before the honors man had a chance to figure anything out. No one knows how Justin got home. Probably like the other losers, by bus. 
Cody didn't care much. Nelly was asking for revenge for her, so he had to think of something else. And the guy had succeeded. Cody knew how to do it. A couple of days after the memorable party at the cottage, he went to Becker's house again. Justin's father opened the door and gave his guest a sullen stare. Are you a boxer or something? The man asked. Cody nodded. It was safer and somehow wiser that way. Becker Sr. seemed sober, but who knows what chronic alcoholics can be like, come in, the man said, but no jokes. Last time I crossed the line myself. But now the world. Good, Cody walked into the hallway and waved at Justin, who looked out of the kitchen apprehensively. Hello? Why are you so frightened? Come on out bravely. Your father and I are best friends. Becker Sr., oddly enough, did not argue. He only pulled up his sliding athletic shorts and muttered, I wasn't into boxing. I was into something else, chess, a checkers. We don't know what years it was. We don't know if it happened at all. The years and vodka had done their work and it was difficult to see any sign of intelligence in the man's eyes. Though he remembered who came to them on Sunday, didn't he? So all was not so hopeless. At least Becker Sr.'s memory had not failed him yet. Why did you come? asked Justin, coming closer, did something happen? What could have happened, wondered Cody, I just came by to see how you were, and to invite you to my birthday party. Are you free on the 15th? Yes, Justin confirmed, and where would you need to come? Your house. Cody shook his head. No, Dad can't stand parties at our house. There's a restaurant on the square. You know? Becker Sr., who had been forgotten, whistled delightedly. What restaurant? The government one? You mean, the one where all the cool people from the city administration gather? Oh, my gosh. Justin, don't hesitate. They don't dilute the wine there, that's for sure. At least you'll get a decent drink, and maybe you'll bring it home too. Dad, I don't drink at all, said Justin, just remember that. You can drink apple juice all night, Cody reassured him, I won't be offended. Are you coming or not? Yes, of course I will, replied Justin, we're friends. His face was so enthusiastic and naive that Cody was embarrassed for a moment. Deceiving an excellent student was like tricking a child. Though what child? Nellie had said he'd almost gotten under her skirts. The whole simple-hearted exterior was just an appearance. I'll wait, then, said Cody with a strained smile, well, I'd better go, I have Scarlett to invite. She doesn't have a phone either. Sorry about the change not giving you a ride. There's some girls from legal asked to go on the road. I couldn't send them on the bus, could I? It's okay, I understand, Justin nodded, you were right to take them and not me. You have to give in to the girls. Again, there was nothing artificial in his voice. If it hadn't been for Nellie, Cody might even have believed him, but Nellie was too important to him to just brush her words aside. He should have gone all the way. The two weeks flew by like the blink of an eye. On his birthday, Cody arrived at the restaurant early to make sure that everything was going right, the tables were set, the waiters were putting the finishing touches on the room, and he had to make a pig of Justin, which Cody did by going to the doorman. He was a typical member of his profession, as they portrayed him in books, with a mustache, in a handsome uniform. Even Cody was a little timid at the sight of such an important person. What to say about Becker, who had to face this type? Good afternoon, the guy greeted him, I've made reservations for tonight at your restaurant. We're going to have a big party and we want everything to go at the highest level, the doorman nodded understandingly. He seemed to understand what Cody was getting at, he said, I'd like to ask you, he said, please make sure that you do a proper face control. Don't let any ragamuffins come in here to get drunk. You know what I mean. Of course, the doorman assured him, don't worry about it. Everything will be done in the best possible way. Soon the guests began to arrive. Cody welcomed them into the hall, smiling, and out of the corner of his eye he glanced outside, looking for the man who was the most important highlight of the day. Justin was late. 
He was often late for classes at the university. He had a habit of being late. Cody was beginning to fear something was up, and the whole thing was going to be ruined, when the honor student appeared. The doorman, formidable as a sheepdog, tensed at his appearance. Working in an expensive restaurant taught him to spot the poor. The man blocked the student's way. Hello, said Justin confusedly, and I have to go inside. I have an invitation for tonight. The doorman shot him a glance, especially lingering at Justin's sneakers. Becker's clothes were more or less decent, though they were someone else's. The shoes, on the other hand, were a failure. Not only were they sneakers, but they were from some unknown place, a flea market at best. There must be some mistake, said the doorkeeper with cold politeness, I would ask you to leave and not block the door. But I'm not blocking the door, you are, answered Becker helplessly, let me through, Cody invited me. His speech sounded more and more like a child's babbling. He looked like a distraught child who was about to cry. Nellie got out of the cab and stared at the scene. What is going on here, she asked. The girl looked gorgeous that day, wearing all the best she had. At the sight of this visitor, the doorman stretched his legs. There's a rascal coming in, he said quickly, he must be thirsty. It happens, Nellie nodded, that's what people have come to, isn't it? They've lost all their dignity. Just for free. Justin was at a loss. It all seemed like a nightmare. Dash, Nellie, what are you talking about, eh, he said, you know I don't drink. Yes, surprised the girl, I don't remember you saying anything like that. But you grabbed a beer bottle at the cottage, and who knows where it went after that. I left there early. I don't know what else you did. Cody realized it was time for him to intervene in this scene, so he went outside and held out his hand to the girl. Hi. You're late as usual. I already thought you weren't coming. Nellie smiled at him. You what? How could I have missed this evening? No one was paying attention to Becker, and the honors student clapped his eyes confusedly. Cody turned to him and said, Justin, you can see you don't belong here. And that's not the main thing either. Maybe they didn't teach you when you were a kid that you shouldn't take things without asking, right? And you don't touch other people's girls either. But now you'll remember that for the rest of your life. Come on, Nellie, he was about to go inside when he noticed Scarlett standing off to the side. The girl was also a little late and had been watching the scene from who knows when. But Cody was uncomfortable that she had seen it all. The guy decided to turn it into a joke, you're late too, he asked, what is it? You all seem to have less respect for me than university professors. You're not usually late for their classes. The headmistress looked at him distrustfully, almost with horror, as if she saw a nasty cockroach in the place of the familiar man. What meanness, she muttered, Cody, I thought you were normal, and it turns out I can't see you. These words of Scarlet, who had always been on his side under all circumstances, hurt Cody. And you think your Becker is a saint? Yeah, the guy snapped, you have no idea what he's done. Whatever it was, you've done worse, the girl retorted, Justin, let's get out of here. Let them celebrate without us. She took Becker's hand and led him toward the bus stop. Cody felt a strange sadness as he watched their sunken figures walk sadly away from the restaurant. He felt so bad. It made him want to cry himself. Let's go to the restaurant, Nellie pulled him, this miserable couple is right about something. We should celebrate. Cody turned away. Looking after Scarlett and Justin made no sense anyway. They had long since disappeared from sight. Still, the celebration was irrevocably ruined. Years later, all Cody could say about the day was that it had been the worst birthday ever. The guests seated in the hall seemed stupid to him, and their toasts were flat and uninteresting. The food was no good, even though it was the best restaurant in town. All the food was tasteless. The only thing that brightened the situation was alcohol, and Cody consumed it like crazy. Life was easier when he was intoxicated. At least Cody could convince himself that there was nothing wrong. But the problems had begun, and Cody became fully aware of them when September 1st came.
It was already the fifth year, and the headmistress, his faithful assistant, had abruptly turned into an enemy. Or no, even worse she had turned into someone who didn't really care what grade he got in the next seminar, or how he was going to correct it. Becker, of course, did everything, too. The honorable man went to class as before, sat modestly in the corner next to Scarlett, and his wretched, despondent appearance sometimes made Cody feel something akin to a twinge of remorse. Justin had stopped wearing the clothes he'd given him, too, and had gone back to his rags. Cody sometimes wondered where his clothes had gone. Had Becker sent them to the trash, sold them, or burned them at the stake, sending curses to his former friend? At times there were marks on the student's face, suspiciously resembling bruises. The student, apparently, tried to cover them up with something, but he did not quite succeed. Justin could have been pitted, if not for one problem, unlike Cody, he had no problem with his grades. Things were moving toward graduation, and the guy was in a silent panic. He had no idea what to do about it all. A relative of the dean's acquaintance had hinted to Cody that he could help with the case for a sum of money. Everything could be arranged, the diploma and the exams, just need to be paid. The money was not insignificant. Even Cody, who did not seem to be poor, did not have such a sum in his hands. When the boy took the risk of asking his father, he immediately suspected something was wrong. Tell me, what have you gotten yourself into, the man said, demanding, some kind of a fight. You owe somebody. Daddy, Cody said indignantly, what kind of a showdown? Then maybe drugs, the man kept up, show me your veins. You need close attention. Don't be crazy, Dad, said Cody, I need to pay for my exams so I don't drop out of university. There's only a few months left and the diploma. Help me. I sat behind a desk for years for nothing, didn't I? The disappointment on his father's face was very strong. It seems the man would have been much less upset if his son had told him he had taken up racketeering. Apparently for nothing, he nodded, because if you'd really studied, this conversation wouldn't have happened between us. I don't want no brainless employees in my company. I thought I promised you a good job after I studied. So here's the deal, either you take all the exams yourself, or you can look for another job. And if anything happens to me, Adrian will run the company. He's good and smart, he got a red diploma in his time. I'd rather let my life's work go to someone else than let my own son run it down. I said it all. The conversation was really over. And no matter how hard Cody tried to change his father's mind, no matter how much he persuaded him, it was to no avail. He had to study on his own. Later, many years later, Cody was grateful to his father for this. The knowledge he received at university did indeed come in handy at work and the occasion when he had to work with his head developed his patience and stamina. These qualities also came in handy for Cody, but a little later, when problems began in his personal life. Nellie's wish came true. They got married. The girl managed to charm even her father-in-law. When it was necessary, she could pretend to be anything in front of Cody's father. She portrayed a smart and savvy girl who even knew a thing or two about politics. Before meeting her, Nellie looked in the paper, just in case. After listening to her judgments, borrowed from some journalist, her father finally believed that with such a wife Cody would not be lost. He gave the young couple an apartment for their wedding. Could not have wished for better. Everyone was happy, except perhaps Zoe. She was jealous of her friend. She was also jealous of Amber, who couldn't stand her brother's groom. This party was much different than Cody's failed birthday party. There was no Scarlett, no Justin, and no one even remembered the face control. Everyone was on their own. There was peace in Cody's life for a few years, the feelings in his heart not yet dead. Nellie, too, looked at her husband in love. She left her job at the cafe and, as Justin had predicted, chose something more beautiful. She had opened a boutique on a main street with the help of her father-in-law, but of course she didn't work in the hall. So what were salespeople for? Nellie leafed through catalogs, imagined herself a fashion designer and chose fabrics, while others did all the dirty work for her. Everything was going well until the birth of her son Miguel. That's when the problems in the couple's family life began. 
Nellie looked at her newborn son with almost hatred, my head is going to explode from all this screaming. All babies scream, don't they? asked Cody, putting Miguel to bed, dad says I screamed until I was two, two. I can see who's to blame now, said Nellie, that's what got Miguel into you. You know, said Cody indignantly, by the way, you never know how you screamed as a kid. Judging by the tantrums you've been throwing lately, your parents must have felt sorry for you. With a voice like that, you must have led them out. You're a bore, muttered Nellie resentfully, it's because you didn't give birth and you don't know the agony I've had to endure and how frayed my nerves are. Cody felt a twinge of remorse. He really had no idea what Nellie was going through. That was something only a woman could do. Still, her treatment of her own son seemed unfair to the man. Maybe you should give up the boutique and take over the house, he suggested, you don't have time for anything. At least you would have had some rest, and you would have talked to your son, watched him grow up. However, even this innocuous idea was not to Nellie's liking. I see, Nellie concluded, do you want me to be a housewife? An ordinary woman in a robe and an apron? I never thought you had such bad taste. I worry you, replied Cody, you're the one who says you're torn between work and home. Here, you should leave your store. It's more loss than income anyway. If Nellie could bear the insult, the boutique's dismissive attitude struck a chord with her. You always thought I was an idiot, she twisted Cody's words, you thought I was good for nothing but hauling trays. And I'll prove it to you all, I'll show you and your father and that silly sister of yours. Miguel will take care of the nanny, and I'll develop. You married a person, not a brainless amoeba. Locking me in house shackles won't work. Nellie kept fiddling with catalogs, flushing the family money down the drain. Cody took care of his son more often than his wife, reading him some books. When he had time, he would roll cars on the floor with him. Unfortunately for him, the closest person to Miguel was the nanny, the model Mary Poppins who came to them from a special agency. The woman was kind, with a pedagogical education and a lot of experience. She was the perfect employee. And yet she was a stranger in their family. Cody was hurt that some Tiffany, not his own mother, had seen Miguel more often and knew all his secrets. And soon a new misfortune came to their family. Cody's father died suddenly of a heart attack. It wasn't until two months after the funeral, going through his papers, that Cody learned that his father had long had health problems. He had even been recommended surgery, but for some reason he refused. Maybe he was afraid. That version seemed the most plausible to Cody. Maybe his father just couldn't find the time to take a break from work. He had always been a hard worker, after all. Cody had to take his father's place and take over the business. He was dizzy with these changes. As a young man, Cody had thought his father was just a nuisance, staying late at work and scrutinizing every document. It wasn't until he was in his shoes that he realized there was no other way. It was enough to miss one figure, and utter chaos ensued. Miguel was completely parentless. Dash, he's like an orphan, thought Cody regretfully, looking in on his son in the evenings when he was asleep. You must think my wife and I are soulless, he once asked the nanny. We're always doing things. We don't see Miguel at all. Tiffany shook her head sadly. I don't think so. I honestly say that. Not because I'm afraid of getting fired. Do you think your family is the only one like that? No, it isn't. Before that I worked in a businessman's house. It was even worse there. The girl's father, a widower, was always away on business trips. She had no mother at all. My daughter called me mom, can you imagine? And I used to look after the artist's son. They were always on tour, and the boy only saw his parents on TV. So you're not so special. At this rate I'll earn the title of father of the year, Cody joked grimly, because I spent every night at home. The woman nodded. Tiffany seemed to be lost in her own thoughts and could no longer hear what he was saying. I'm good, too, she muttered, I babysit other people's children and I don't see my grandchildren for months. They live in another city. I can't afford to visit them on my pension alone. 
so I work so I can get out to see them sometimes. You never told me about that, Cody remarked. What's the point of that, the woman shrugged, I come to work, not to cry. Still, Cody thought it all mattered. He almost forcefully handed Tiffany a bonus and gave her a few days off. Dash, I can't let you go for long, he said, not without your help. But it's my duty to help you with the money. Take a plane, get the most expensive tickets, and I'll babysit my son if you have to. Cody really thought it was the right thing to do. He left the Enterprise to Adrian and spent the week with Miguel himself. Cody suggested that Nellie join them, but without much hope. The wife was getting deeper and deeper into her work. Or maybe she had found some other interests. In life, the couple had so rarely spoken to each other that Cody didn't really know what his wife was up to. Deep down, he knew he didn't want to know. The truth would bring new problems into his life. Cody was so exhausted at work that he preferred to turn a blind eye to trouble rather than face it. He remembered that week for a long time. Largely because he rarely allowed himself such liberties later, every day off from work was invaluable. Cody was eager to make the most of it. He and Miguel went to the zoo, to the merry-go-round, out to some children's show, where the boy burst out laughing. Later, Cody would look at the pictures from those days and he couldn't believe it was real. It was too rare that he got to see his family. Miguel grew up in the years that followed, but his parents were hardly involved in his life. Tiffany went with him to matinees, and trouble at Cody's school was reported over the phone. Nellie didn't want to get into those problems. Fighting, smoking in the bathroom, she said, it's all men's business. The father plays a big role in raising a son. You take care of those problems. And Cody did as much as he could. What could he do, though? Talk to his son? He tried. But all the smart talk bounced off Miguel. The teenager was staring past his father and thinking about his own business, as if what was happening didn't concern him at all. Cody didn't know how to get through to his son. It was Friday in the Cody household. An ordinary day. Busy with work, Cody had a meeting and was about to look at papers when the secretary reported that he had a visitor. Who of the man inquired, going over possible business partners, requesters, and female employees of various services in his mind. The answer was unexpected. Amber, your sister. Amber had been married for three years and had moved to the other side of town. It seemed to be a miserable distance between them, about an hour if there was traffic, and yet it was an insurmountable barrier for brother and sister. They saw each other a couple of times a year, calling each other only on holidays. Cody had a job, Amber had a family. She was raising two little twins. Cody and Amber didn't have much time for each other. And now all of a sudden. Let her come in, he commanded. Amber appeared to him in a slight irritation. This was evident from the woman's furrowed brow. Still, at the sight of Cody she found the strength to smile. Hello, said Amber, this is what we've come to. I have to ask permission to come into your office. Yeah, not like the old days, Cody teased her, when you used to break into my room without permission. Remember? I sure could have used a guard against that kind of intrusion back then. That was a great time. Amber nodded, I miss it so much, she paused, staring at Cody, then said, you didn't have dark circles under your eyes then, though. And your hair looked thicker. You need to rest. Cody wanted to reply to his sister that she hadn't gotten any younger either, but that would have been too rude, so he just said, someone has to work so everyone else can rest. I have a family, after all. And I forgot. And what you call family can hardly be called that. What do you mean? Cody didn't understand. Many things are vague, answered Amber, here, for instance, Miguel. Do you know what he's into? What are his friends' names? Where did they go together last time? And when was that? Not ten years ago, when he was in kindergarten? I see, Cody guessed, you've come to lecture me. You shouldn't. It doesn't suit you. And yet, the sister kept up, what's your relationship with your son? 
I have more of a relationship with Miguel's class teacher than I do with him. She regularly calls me on the phone to tell me about his shenanigans. And you think that's okay? You don't think it's your fault? Cody sighed heavily. I don't understand where you're going with this. What am I supposed to do? Quit my job. Sit at home and do therapy with Miguel? He won't thank me for that. He's used to having a good life. Otherwise, he can't. And what about Nellie? She, too, is used to the sweet life. Branded clothes, travel, other men. What are you talking about? Cody said indignantly, what other men? Don't play dumb, Amber said glumly, I know you know all about it. And if you don't, you're guessing. You've never been so simple-minded that you didn't notice anything. Maybe Nellie has someone, Cody admitted, I haven't cared for years. Can you believe it? We live like strangers, we don't get in each other's way, and it's fine. I don't even want to get into it. And what will Miguel think about all this? My mother never cared about him anyway. Miguel is old enough to understand, Amber remarked, you're only doing him a disservice by keeping the truth from the boy. Cody realized that he couldn't argue with his sister, so he decided to go at it from the other end. What makes you think Nellie has anyone at all, he asked, do you have any proof or facts? No proof, but I saw with my own eyes she was flirting in a cafe with some man last weekend. She even kissed him on the cheek. I wanted to call you, but I didn't think it was a phone call. It's better to break that kind of news in person. I guess you did it to see what my face would make, Cody queried. Amber shook her head sadly. What a fool you are after all. I'm genuinely worried about you. But Cody was made worse by her sister's worries. He really preferred not to know all this. Other families lived somehow, and each one had its own secret. He was too tired at work to get involved in these matters. Besides, remembering what a master of scandal Nellie was, the thought of talking to her made Cody want to hang himself. Suddenly, he got a call from a number he didn't know. The voice belonged to Miguel, but the guy spoke so incoherently that it was impossible to make out anything. Speak clearly. Explain. What happened? Come quickly, asked Miguel, or however you can. I'll wait for you at the corner of the square. You'll see. The guy's tone was mournful. It didn't sound like the eternally cheerful Miguel. Cody knew right away that something was wrong and jumped up. Were you beaten up? Or was there an accident, he asked. Just come over, dad, the boy pleaded and dropped the call. Cody was in such a hurry that he almost forgot his car keys. The receptionist shouted something in his wake about the inspection, but he didn't hear her. All his thoughts were on his son. Exactly what Cody had feared had happened. Miguel had been beaten, or he himself had gotten into a fight. It was impossible to know at once. The only thing Cody realized was that his son looked very, very bad and was in great pain, judging by the grimace that distorted his face. Who was it? The man asked angrily, as he jumped out of the car, you tell me exactly who it was. I'll take care of it. Dad, don't, Miguel was embarrassed, I'm not in kindergarten to intercede. I'll take care of it. I can see how you've figured it out. Were you robbed? Where's your phone? Miguel pulled a smartphone out of his pocket. The screen was black and showing no signs of life. There was also a huge crack running down it. It's broken, the guy said grimly, this guy wanted to kick me and hit me with the phone. What's the jerk's name, clarified Cody. Miguel sighed heavily. Forget about him, dad, it won't happen again. It's over. Cody realized from the sad look in his son's eyes that this wasn't just a fight between boys. There was obviously something or someone else involved. A girl's fight, asked Cody. Yes, Kim, Miguel confirmed, we kind of had a thing. We went out. I even took her to a concert. There were some guys from the Capitol came, and I couldn't get tickets. I found them. Even though I paid a lot more than the usual price. And she. 
I found out today that Kim also goes out with others. With me during the day and with them at night. And vice versa. She probably even had her schedule set up a month in advance. It's a good thing the guys told me how they saw her with that creep. Miguel had such an unhappy, battered face, it made Cody's heart race. It was his son. Some bastard had dared to raise his hand, and more importantly, over what? Cody only now realized that it might have been him in Miguel's shoes. If Cody had questioned his sister more, made connections, and found out who Nelly had kissed in the cafe, it might have ended the same way. How ironic. Cody put his arm around Miguel's shoulder and smiled through his strength. Don't get upset over some girls. Women aren't worth getting killed over. Believe me. Not even mom? Miguel asked quickly. Cody looked at him carefully. His son had a face like he really knew something. But how? Let's get out of here and go to some diner, Cody said, evasively, I'm honestly starving. And I think it's been a long time since you've eaten, too. My father's ruse worked. Miguel perked up. Dad, you can't stand those places, can you? There's all kinds of hamburgers. And now all of a sudden I do, said Cody, are you coming or not? Let's drown our sorrows in lemonade. Deep down, he feared that the time when such things were done with his son was long gone. But it turned out that Miguel, despite his 15 years, was still a child at heart. Maybe it was simpler than that. They both felt very lonely at that moment and just needed each other's shoulder. After that incident, something changed between them. Cody wouldn't say what exactly, but somehow he and his son became imperceptibly closer. He found time in the middle of the day to call Miguel and see how he was doing. And even if his son grumbled about it, he never gave up the phone and answered all his questions. And sometimes he called his father himself to ask him jokingly if he had killed any of the employees. How are your fools? Still making mistakes in the paperwork? No less than you are in the controls, Cody nodded, I'm already thinking of firing him. So study hard, Miguel, I won't hire you with D's. There are plenty of other idiots. Cody himself didn't realize he was talking the way his father had. They were a lot alike. Cody's temples had also turned gray with age, his weight had also increased, and even his voice had become low and husky. He also inherited his father's illnesses, Cody's heart problems began when he was in his early 40s. At first, the man didn't pay attention to it and was treated with inexpensive pills taken on the advice of the first pharmacist he saw. Perhaps it was self-inflicted, but Cody did get better. Then the remedy stopped working. Nellie was very seldom at home and interacted with her husband as a stranger. That's why Miguel was the first to notice what was wrong. It was almost impossible to get her father to talk. He was immersed in his work, so the young man did something much easier. By that time, he had already graduated from university and was working at his father's company. Miguel simply went to the receptionist and asked to make an appointment with his boss. The girl looked at him as if she suspected a prank. Do you want an appointment with Cody? The receptionist said in amazement. Yes, why are you surprised? Miguel asked. By the way, I have an important proposal to the management. The girl believed it. Moira was not silly and worked well, diligently following instructions, but in some situations she was still very trusting. Miguel even pitied her for that. But why can't you discuss all this at home? At the family table, Moira wondered. Do you want me to talk about blueprints at home, too? The boy resented, in my spare time I prefer not to think about work. I didn't think you'd think of me that way. The receptionist was embarrassed. I'm sorry, Moira muttered, I don't know what came over me. Of course I'll write you down. I don't mind. Miguel smiled and handed her a chocolate bar. Moira heartily thanked him. The days when Miguel was a teenage loser bullied by sassy girls were long gone. Things were different now. He was well aware of the impression he was making on the girls and he was shamelessly taking advantage of it. Actually, he could have done without the gifts. Moira would have done anything for him. But Miguel was used to being polite. 
He was already aware that the conversation he was about to have was unlikely to please his father. He had to be more careful and get at least one person's support around these parts, even if that person was the silly Moira. At the appointed time Miguel knocked on the door and smiled. Good afternoon. May I come in? Why did you come, inquired Cody, without lifting his head from his papers. To talk, replied Miguel, I made an appointment with you. Didn't you check the visitors list? Cody pulled out some paper and frowned at it. That's right, he remarked, here's your time from 2.30 to 2.45. Is this some kind of joke? If it is, thank you. It's a good one. I'm having a lot of fun. So you can go to work. No, it's not a joke, the boy objected, walking into the office and taking a seat across from his father, we need to have a serious talk. About what? Can't it wait till the end of the day, Cody asked irritably, I've got a lot of work to do and if I don't get it done in time, it'll be bad for everybody. Especially you. Miguel hardly listened to him. He was staring at his father, so he noticed that he had raised his hand to his chest in an unaccountable, almost unconscious gesture. No, dad, this conversation is more important, replied the lad, forget about your job. We've got other problems. What other problems? Cody looked at his son's tense face, and he had a terrible suspicion, did you get somebody pregnant? Yes. Not Wanda from the finance department, I hope. What kind of vulgar thought is that, said Miguel indignantly, what do you take me for? I always go to work, not to chase girls. And what does Wanda have to do with anything? I never even liked her. It didn't seem that way to me, the man remarked, at the last meeting you looked at each other for an hour. I was making friendly contact with her, his son admonished him. I don't know what you imagined. But now I get answers from the finance department without errors or delays. I used to wait weeks. So you learn, dad. All right, I'll give you credit for the wonders of diplomacy, Cody gave in, so, what did you want to talk about then? What's the big deal? It hasn't happened yet. But it might, Miguel corrected him, what's in your heart, dad? Judging by your grimace, things haven't been going well lately. It's all right, answered Cody dryly, my heart is perfectly fine and hasn't turned to stone yet. You don't have to worry about your bonus. Seriously, said Miguel, don't you think anyone sees you clutching at your heart like it's jumping out of your chest? I'm going to disappoint you. Yes, they have, and they're already talking about it. They even brought up the fact that your father died because of his heart. Do you think I like hearing about it? Don't you really care? Cody was silent, not knowing what to answer. He himself periodically thought about it, but constantly consoled himself with the thought that there was still time, he would definitely get an examination, but a little later. On vacation, for example. Cody hadn't taken a vacation in three years. Are you going to go to the hospital yourself, or should I force you to go? Mind you, I'm becoming your successor. I'm not ready yet. It's a shame to give everything to Adrian. I'll go, Cody said reluctantly, otherwise you won't let go. Right. But I'll take you myself, Miguel stipulated. I want to make sure that you do not cheat me and do not run away at the last moment. I've already chosen a doctor, found information on the internet and the clinic. You're saying you're not ready to be the successor, Cody interjected with such urgency, you've got it all figured out, I see. The man fervently hoped that the matter would be confined to one trip. He thought they would just take a cardiogram and prescribe some pills. But it turned out to be much more serious. The doctor clearly didn't like the cardiogram. And then Miguel came along and enlightened the doctor by saying, Dash, actually, my grandfather died because of a heart problem. So it could be hereditary. You examine him thoroughly. The doctor nodded. Actually, I think it wouldn't hurt to have an examination myself. To be honest, the results of your cardiogram give me some concerns. The symptoms you described complete the picture. As he went through the tests, Cody cursed his frankness a hundred times. He should have withheld some symptoms and embellished reality a little. For example, 
not to tell him that climbing stairs lately had been causing him silent panic and that his heart was seizing up more and more frequently. He's gone off the deep end. Now we have to reap the benefits. However, the verdict of the cardiologist was so disappointing that even the resentment of Cody, irritated by his son's willfulness and his own talkativeness, has gone into the background. You have ischemia in a rather advanced stage, the doctor informed him, so why are you taking so long? With your diagnosis you shouldn't have gone to the hospital, you should have run. He can't run, muttered Miguel, who constantly accompanied him to the hospital, like some kind of nurse. Cody was prescribed treatment, but the man didn't notice much effect. Maybe it was because he'd been a nervous wreck lately. Problems haunted him not only at work, but also in life. And the strange thing was that Nellie was beginning to take an excessive interest in the lives of her husband and son. How are you at work, my dears, she asked on one of the rare evenings when the whole family gathered together. What do you care, mom, replied Miguel, not too friendly, are you suddenly interested in economics or some kind of economist? There was silence over the table for a moment. Then Nellie laughed. You've always been a humorist, my dear, the woman remarked, that's why I love you. Yes? And I thought you hated me, the son retorted, at least, it's more like it. Nellie's lips trembled and she looked at Cody resentfully. And you will silently watch your own son insult his mother and your wife? Nellie, end this spectacle, Cody asked, say straight out what you want. And end this conversation. Let Miguel and I have dinner in peace. The woman did not protest. This seemed to suit her fine. I need money, she said, one of my friends is a very talented director. He's thinking of making a film, but he needs money for that. I'd like to help. If I become a sponsor, perhaps I can even star in the title role. Cody was just letting her take how much money she needed when her son laughed. Director, so that life-beaten dude? Is that the man with the beard I saw you with a couple of weeks ago? Is he making a movie? You were looking at each other so languidly. I thought he was a professor, but he turned out to be a cultural worker. I never thought you'd say that. What languid looks? If you want, I'll call it something else, the guy replied, you looked at each other for a long time, and then you kissed some more, got in the car and drove off in an unknown direction. I didn't follow you. I didn't have time for that. It was clear enough, you know. Nellie's lips quivered. The woman looked at Cody, and suddenly her eyes hardened. Yes, it's true, she said, I fell in love with someone else. What do you think I should have done? Wait at home like a faithful girl while you're both away at work? We haven't even got a family left. All because you two have only money on your minds. I never really had a family, said Miguel, raising his voice, because I didn't have a mother but I'm not complaining. I'm not acting like some fallen woman because I'm traumatized. They began to argue with excitement and a kind of desperation, as if they were exhausted, waiting for this moment. Miguel was telling his mother everything that had built up in his years of lonely orphanhood. Nellie accused her son of being callous and loveless. They both forgot about the father, who suddenly shouted. Shut up now, they hushed and looked at him. Nellie with indignation, Miguel with consternation. The pain in his heart, which Cody seemed to have grown accustomed to as something unavoidable, became unbearable. Under the veil that obscured his eyes, the man saw Miguel jump up and rush out of the room. From somewhere in the distance, his son's voice came to Cody, Where's my phone? Why is it never around when you need it? Mom, what are you sitting around for? Nellie, unmoving, continued to sit in her chair. The last question Cody asked before he finally lost consciousness was how his wife reacted to his seizure. He woke up in a hospital room with walls painted a beige color, very pleasing to the eye. Everywhere there was a beeping sound of sophisticated instruments that were scary to touch. Cody himself felt as drained as a lemon. He was aching mentally and physically, and he had no energy at all. Such fatigue was not experienced even after sleepless nights devoted to work. Could a heart attack have exhausted him like that? How long had it been since then? 
Through the blinds, which someone had carefully covered to keep out the light, a ray of sunlight pierced him. So it had been a whole night or more since the house dinner, considering how bright the sun was shining. Cody wanted to put his feet off the bed and try to get to the door, but he was shackled with wires like some kind of mummy. And they stuck in four in his arm. Then the man tried to raise his voice. Hello, he shouted, is anyone here? It was probably not a scream, but the wheeze of a drowned man. Cody surprised himself. Not even an inveterate smoker's voice sounded like that. It was as if he hadn't opened his mouth in a week. A young woman in a white robe peeked through the door and smiled. You're awake now. Wait a couple of minutes. Now I'll call your attending physician. What doctor? Wait a minute. Explain to me what happened to me, Cody asked. I'm just a nurse and I can't discuss these things, the woman replied, I'll just say that you had the operation. Stephen will tell you the rest, she was about to leave the room but was almost knocked off her feet when Miguel burst in. He looked so shocked, like there was a fire in the building. Daddy, he shouted, you've come to your senses. I heard your voice, but I thought I was imagining things. Cody was surprised to see tears glistening in his son's eyes. Nothing like that had happened to Miguel in 20 years, since kindergarten. Why don't I come to my senses, asked Cody, son, is this the first time you've seen a man faint? What faint, the boy exclaimed. Shut up, the nurse sternly interrupted him, I'll call the doctor. She left the room at a brisk pace, and Miguel sank into a chair with the look of a guilty teenager. So, what's up, asked Cody, what's with all the secrecy around here? You'd better let the doctor tell you himself, replied Miguel, my god, dad, I'm so glad you're alive. Dash, Miguel, aren't you drunk by any chance, asked Cody suspiciously, no offense, but you don't look normal and your speech is strange. Stephen will explain it to you, he repeated, I really shouldn't talk. But I'm glad it worked out. Cody felt uncomfortable under his son's enthusiastic gaze and decided to change the conversation to something else. Yesterday was Wednesday, he remarked, so today is a work day. So why are you here with me? Because it's not Thursday, it's Sunday, Miguel replied, and I haven't been at work at all these days. I took some time off. Adrian will solve everything. He should have a monument in his lifetime, muttered Cody, but wait, how is it Sunday? Miguel didn't have time to answer. Footsteps were heard in the hallway, and a serious man in a white coat and glasses, accompanied by the same nurse, entered the room. Dash, good afternoon, he introduced himself, my name is Stephen, I'm a surgeon and I'm also your attending physician. Surgeon, Cody asked at a loss, have I been operated on? What happened to me? Miguel and the doctor looked at each other, as if they were having a silent dialogue. Cody began to guess something. Did I have some kind of pacemaker, some kind of bypass surgery? What else do you have? You had a donor heart transplant, Stephen said. Hearing this news, Cody nearly jumped up and down on the bed. What, are you serious? Was my condition so severe that I wouldn't have survived with my heart? Your condition was indeed critical, the doctor replied, we could have used preventive measures to see what would happen next, but your son, I was the one who insisted on the operation, Miguel said firmly, I'm sorry, dad, but I was afraid of losing you, I thought it would be better, and standing behind Stephen, the boy made signs to his father begging him to be quiet. Cody decided to obey, though he had many questions. What's the matter, the man asked as the medical staff left the room, what are you up to? You made the decision to operate for me. Now you won't let me talk. Where did the donor come from, anyway? I heard you have to wait many months for a donor. I heard that too, Miguel agreed, that's why I offered you money to get out of line. And don't even ask me how much, your life means more to me. No way. Another city, treatment, pills. I told you I care about you, the boy repeated, at least stop counting your money today, dad. Would you rather leave me with all these papers and a mother who's about to bring home a new boyfriend? How do you even know about Nellie, wondered Cody, how long? 
About 16 years, the guy replied, I'm not as dumb as they sometimes make me out to be. I know, Cody nodded, you're the best I've got. Miguel put his arm around him tightly. The gesture spoke more than a thousand words. Cody had been in the hospital for a long time, it seemed like an eternity. During that time, he felt like something of an experimental specimen. So often Cody was examined, various tests were taken, and numbers were charted. Nellie appeared to her husband only once. And that, it seemed to Cody, was just a courtesy. He was surprised, though, that his wife tried to keep to the rules of decorum, which he thought were unnecessary, since during her visit to the hospital she had hardly uttered a dozen words. Mother no longer lives with us, Miguel said when Cody shared the news with him, I advised her to pack her things and move in with her director, since they were in love. She listened. How easily she agreed with you, marveled Cody. It wasn't easy, but she had to do it, Miguel said without any explanation or detail. Cody never found out what his son had threatened Nellie with. The first time after the surgery, the man felt very strange. He often touched his chest, listened to the pounding of his heart, and could not believe that it had previously belonged to a stranger. Maybe some criminal or murderer. Who knew who that man had been, and what had become of his family? How are they now without him? The gradual desire to find out who his donor was turned into an idea for Cody. Even Miguel noticed it. What are you thinking about again, Dad? He asked as Cody stared out the window once more. About why you're always in the hospital at 26, the man muttered, don't you have anything else to do? Are you talking about work? I do everything from my laptop, the guy replied, if it's about friends, they'll understand, and if not, they weren't friends. And if it's about girls. Dad, you said yourself that you shouldn't worry about women. There's a lot of them, and I'm alone. I want to control everything. You're like a daddy's boy, muttered Cody, aren't you laughing yourself? No, it isn't, replied the lad calmly, now tell me, what's the matter? Thinking again about that poor man who died so that you could live? Cody looked at him indignantly. Just don't talk like that. As if I wished him dead. So you're thinking about him after all, the boy kept up. Yes, admitted Cody, but Stephen refuses to give out any information about him, saying the man wanted to help pro bono, made a will while he was still alive, and other nonsense. We should give him money, Miguel suggested, it wouldn't do anyone any harm anyway. It's not like we're going to harass the man's relatives. We just want to know the details. Maybe even help them in some way. Quit that habit of offering money to everybody, said Cody grudgingly, it's disgusting. Don't think I'm saying it out of greed, I just don't want you to make a habit of it. Okay, I won't do it again, said the boy angrily, then stop thinking about your donor. Still, these thoughts continued to run through Cody's head in the hospital, and even after he was discharged. There was a lot waiting for him at work. And all the man's thoughts were about one thing. Desperate, Cody let his son do as he naturally wished. Miguel quickly got results. Only Cody didn't know whether to rejoice or cry. The name printed on the paper came as a shock to him. Justin Becker is this some kind of practical joke? You say he was your friend, asked Miguel, looking over his father's shoulder, wow. I can imagine what would have happened if I had a heart transplant from my classmate. I probably wouldn't be too happy about it. That's what I'm saying, Cody muttered, so Justin's dead and I did this bad thing to him in my day? All your sins are absolved by the statute of limitations, said Miguel, but if you still have a guilty conscience, why don't you go to his folks and see if they need any help? They might be glad you're coming. Arrange for his kids to get an apartment or a place at Harvard. What's the big deal? Cody barely listened to what his son was saying. He looked at the name of the donor's wife and doubted very much if she would be happy to see him. Scarlett Becker, it turns out the headmistress and the honors student were married after all. Cody didn't have many pictures from his student days, but he did have some. Scarlett was rare here. Justin only showed up in one photo. Obviously, he was occupied with only one science. Miguel, seeing the picture, muttered, that guy looks like an honors student. 
Don't call him that, Cody asked, he was a very smart guy. After all this time, he'd almost forgotten why he was mad at Justin, because of Nellie. What nonsense. She'd had so many lovers since then that if Cody had thought to take revenge on every one of them, he'd have gone to jail. And was she really worth it? Now, looking back, Cody could say with certainty that she wasn't. Finally, the man's patience burst. I'll go to them and see how the family lives, Cody told his son, and I don't care what they think. Even if Scarlett gets into a fight. But I do care, objected Miguel, I'll go with you. I don't want you to be killed by the wife of the one who saved you before. Cody was convinced he was doing the right thing. On arrival, however, his first misgivings came. The multi-story house in which Justin lived had only become dilapidated over the years, and he, Cody, was only further bathed in money. That fact alone could in no way beautify him in Becker's eyes. Have you changed your mind, Dad, asked Miguel. Cody shook his head. No, let's go upstairs, they approached the entryway at the same time as some old woman. She eyed the strangers suspiciously, but let them in nonetheless. The first barrier is past, joked Miguel, I hope the next one won't be difficult. Cody walked to the familiar door and held his breath for a moment. There was shouting coming from the apartment. Just as then, experiencing a keen sense of deja vu, the man pressed the bell button. They were opened almost immediately. The door was swung open, almost hitting Cody on the forehead. He managed to step back, and the girl who had jumped out of the apartment flew into Miguel's arms and mouthed piteously, help. Behind her rushed an old man in a t-shirt and sweatpants. This picture was so familiar to Cody that he had little doubt how it would end. Freeze, the old man said menacingly. Miguel punched him in the chest and he flew to the floor. Are you a boxer or something? Hello again, Gareth. Cody stopped, not knowing the old man's middle name, and you haven't changed much. And you act the same. Becker Sr. looked at him with hatred. The girl pulled away from Miguel and asked who they were. Are you the internet service providers? Yes. Thank you, but we don't need anything. Miguel laughed. No one has ever suspected me of handing out flyers. What an original introduction. Don't you think? The girl smiled sweetly at him and held out her hand. My name is Alicia, and who are you? Alicia, Cody clarified. He remembered from his papers that Becker had a daughter. The girl nodded, we're here to see your mother, Cody said. She's not home right now. She should be home soon, replied the girl, you can go in and wait for her in the kitchen. I'm afraid to be alone with grandpa anyway. He's violent now. The old man continued to sit on the floor and mutter something to himself. Miguel asked, what's the problem? Grandpa realized that my mother and I had mixed his vodka with water, Alicia confessed, I thought he would kill me for it. I will if you keep doing that, the old man replied. I won't let him, said Miguel with a knightly tone, if you have to, call me for help. Thank you, she smiled, if you leave me your number I'll be sure to call you. Alicia, unlike Justin, was a pretty little thing, petite, with red curls and blue eyes. A real doll. Miguel, of course, was also handsome. All over Nellie. Cody, who had been forgotten, looked at them and realized that they liked each other at first sight. Another problem. As if there weren't enough of them already. Now Scarlett would still call him a matchmaker. He had found a place to bring his son. Alicia fussed with the kettle. Miguel devoured her with his eyes. And Cody himself suddenly felt old and unwanted, outdated. He felt like junk that had been thrown away. Justin's father sat down beside him and stared at the man with a cloudy look. Did you bring a drink? He asked curtly. I don't drink, Cody answered briefly. Who goes to a party without a drink, said Gareth dismissively, that's rude. Or are you on the wagon? Cody didn't have time to answer. The key turned in the lock, and someone entered the apartment. Alicia, a woman's voice called out, what's the mess in the hallway? 
Why is the coat rack on the floor again? It's mom, the girl explained in a whisper and ran into the hallway. Cody sat still. He recognized the headmistress voice at once. He had not changed a bit over the years. Was it worth hoping that time had smoothed out Scarlett's dislike for him? The man still remembered that look she had thrown at him outside the restaurant, as if she had seen a cockroach. Scarlett, accompanied by her daughter, walked into the kitchen and froze when she saw the uninvited guests. Good afternoon, she said at a loss, and who are you? Let me ask you something. And this is for you, mother, said Alicia, I didn't have time to find out why they came, but I let them into the apartment. Without taking her eyes off Cody, Alicia began to scold her daughter. What did I ever teach you? They protected me from grandpa, she muttered, but Scarlett wasn't listening to her anymore. Cody stood up, awkwardly adjusted his jacket, and said, Hi. It's been a long time. A long time, Scarlett said, without any hint of hospitality, why the sudden surprise visit? What do you want? Hey, don't be rude to my father, said Miguel indignantly, what right do you have to talk to him like that? Scarlett looked at him. Cody decided to introduce the boy, this is Miguel, my son. I see, the woman nodded, he's just as impudent. Just like you were. Mom, do you know each other? asked Alicia, curiously. Gareth, who was in a fog of intoxication and had only one thing on his mind, finished the conversation. Let's toast to acquaintance, he announced, we must get the glasses. He got up from the table and almost fell over. Miguel barely managed to catch the old man by the armpits and set him back down. Dash, get out of here, said Scarlett in an emphatic tone, this isn't a zoo or a circus show. We'll definitely leave, promised Cody, but first I'd like to talk about your husband. After twenty years, muttered Scarlett, what a surprise. Did you really want to ask him to forgive you? Yes, really, it's probably too late. I've come to thank Justin, I mean his relatives, you. For what? Scarlett asked in surprise. Cody put his hand to his chest muttered, for the heart. Alicia sank back in her chair in amazement. Scarlett looked as if she had heard something awful. So Justin's heart was transplanted into you? Cody nodded. The woman's eyes filled with tears. There must be some mistake, she whispered, this is just a mockery of his memory. So my husband died to save your life? Can you explain what the problem is, came Miguel's voice. The problem is, young man, that in his distant youth your father did an awful thing to Justin, said Scarlett. He humiliated him, betrayed him, made a fool of him. And now he comes and says that on top of everything else he took his heart. Took it from a ragamuffin, and he didn't scruple to take it. I was young and foolish then, said Cody, raising his voice a little, I wouldn't say anything like that now. What does that mean? A little younger than you, Scarlett said, turning to Miguel. Can't we talk in private? I asked Cody, there's no reason to involve the children in this story. We'd be only too happy to, said Miguel and turned to Alicia, shall we go for a walk? Show me the local sights. I would love to, said Alicia, I don't understand much of what's going on here anyway. The young men left. Gareth was asleep in the corner. Cody looked at Scarlett and said, I'm sorry. It's too late to ask forgiveness, Scarlett said, the past can never be undone. Maybe it's too late to execute me, then, Cody asked, life has not been kind to me as it is. Do you think I thought of changing one heart for another for my own pleasure? And what was wrong with you, asked Scarlett, softening a little. Ischemia in a very advanced stage, replied Cody, perhaps, if it hadn't been for Justin, I wouldn't be here. And now he's gone. It happens in life, doesn't it? Yes, you were friends, then you were enemies. And now life has brought you together like this, after all these years. How did Justin die? asked Cody quietly. He was in an accident, Scarlett said, he was a sales rep, spent all his time on the road. He collided on the highway with some drunk driver. Doctors say Justin died almost immediately, didn't even suffer. I want to go to his grave sometime, Cody said, will you take me there? 
maybe on my day off, the woman replied. They fell silent. Cody realized he had to go. I guess I'll go then, he muttered, your phone number is in the paperwork. Call me on Saturday? Scarlett nodded, not looking up. Going outside, Cody wanted to find his son, but immediately realized that wasn't a good idea. Miguel must have lured his companion away with a conversation and taken her to an unknown place. The couple were probably already sitting in some cafe laughing at the guy's silly jokes. Spontaneous dates are never a problem for Miguel. All the way home, the man remembered Scarlett's face. She had, of course, aged over the years. But which one of them had gotten younger? Cody, too, had not been spared by age. He had already changed his heart. And yet there was something else in Scarlett's eyes, a kind of hopelessness, as if she no longer expected anything good from life. Maybe the effects of life with an alcoholic father-in-law? Who would be thrilled to have a relative like that? No one was waiting for Cody at home. Nellie was out with her director. Miguel was off on another love affair. He could have gone to bed, but Cody decided to wait for his son. Miguel's absence disturbed him. He might seem like a big boy, but this time Cody wasn't worried that his son might get into trouble. He was worried that Miguel might get someone else into trouble. The boy returned well past midnight in an unbuttoned jacket and slightly drunk. Oh, Dad, you're awake, smiled Miguel, is it all right that you've been prescribed a daily regimen, rest and all that? I'll show you such rest. Where have you been all this time? First we went for a walk with Alicia, then I stopped by the bar, the guy enumerated, what's the problem? The problem is that you rushed to seduce the first girl you saw, said Cody, do you think she's even 20? Who seduced her? Dad, you're out of your mind. You can't think of anything else. We just went for a walk for a while, and then I walked her home. That's all. Are you sure? Cody asked suspiciously. Exactly, Miguel muttered, and she's a good girl after all. I'll see you this weekend. Cody sighed heavily, asking his son to control himself. Her mother already thinks I'm the spawn of hell, and she'll kill me because of you. Did you have something with her, Miguel asked interestedly, I mean before. At university. No, Cody shook his head, Scarlett wasn't interested in anything else, but her studies then, he said, and thought to himself, maybe he hadn't given her that chance himself. Come to think of it, the girl had always singled him out of the group, never let anyone else cheat. And anyway, she was looking at him too intently, as if she was really waiting for something. The weekend came, and Cody went to get Scarlett to take her to the cemetery. The day was windy, and it was raining, but the man didn't want to change his mind, he feared Scarlett would change her mind and not make another appointment. But she agreed. Dash, hi, she said, getting into the car, you should have worn black. Justin didn't like that color. I'm sorry, I didn't know, Cody said, embarrassed as he looked over his mournful black jacket. You weren't interested in it at all. I remember you only started hanging out with Justin because you needed an able performer to do your term papers for you. And then when Justin wasn't needed, you just chased him away. I did that because he was hitting on Nellie, Cody said. Scarlett looked at the man as if he had said some rare nonsense. And you believe that, she asked, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Now maybe I don't, Cody muttered, remembering the unknown director and Nellie's other lovers, but then I did. Your intelligence was even worse than I expected, Scarlett sighed, and why was you the only one I liked? What? I asked Cody dumbfoundedly. I liked you, repeated Scarlett, only it doesn't matter now. I was young and stupid too. I was foolish, too, for looks and money, and that's what you want, a man with a soul. Cody said nothing. There was no point in arguing with her. And they had already arrived at the cemetery. Scarlett made her way to the right tombstone and stopped in front of it. Cody froze beside it. Watching Justin's aged face staring back at him from the photograph was very strange. It seemed as if the honors student was accusing him of something. Did he think of me? asked Cody. 
Rarely, the woman replied, as you can imagine, it wasn't a pleasant subject for either of us. Did you ever think of us? I did, I guess, but rarely, too. I just didn't have time all my life. Work. As if there was nothing else. It's good that at least Miguel is with me. And the wife, asked Scarlett. What kind of wife is Nelly? a waved Cody, one name. They stood by the grave for a while longer. The rain began to fall harder, and Cody wrapped Scarlett in his morning jacket. Dash, I'm sorry about that incident at the restaurant, Cody said, turning to the picture of Justin, really, you were always better than me, better than all of us. Drops of water dripped down the photo like tears. Cody and Scarlett turned and walked slowly toward the car. Since then, they began calling each other infrequently, but without those calls, Cody became restless. At first Scarlett spoke to him without much warmth, rather dryly, but gradually she thought out. The woman didn't complain much about life, but it was clear from her voice that not everything was as smooth as Scarlett wanted to show. Alicia has become secretive, she admitted, we used to talk to each other a lot, but now it's hard to get a word out of her. She smiles mysteriously. Is she in love with somebody? Cody had his own thoughts on the matter, but he preferred to keep them to himself. Especially since Miguel flatly refused to part with Alicia. Dash, are you going to let me down, said Cody, why do you want Alicia? Don't you have enough other girls? Or are you going out with her to spite me? There are other girls, but she's better than them, the guy replied, don't worry. I'm like a knight with her. I don't hurt Alicia. And anyway, nothing like that happened with her, we're just hanging out. Your Scarlet just has nothing to complain about. Nothing happened, said Cody confusedly, that's where you surprised me. A little more and I'll start to think I raised a decent man. Thank you, Miguel muttered, I think you thought I was a degenerate. Still, Cody was worried about how Scarlet would feel about their relationship when the truth came out. So far he preferred to keep a woman in the dark, simply delaying the inevitable. But forever cannot go on like this. However, Scarlet had other reasons to be upset. One day Cody accidentally met a woman on the street, or rather purposely drove past her house, expecting that they would cross paths, and they did. Scarlet, laden with packages, was walking home. She was so deeply immersed in joyless thoughts that she did not immediately notice the car pulling up next to her. Hi, Cody called out to the woman, do you need a ride? Scarlet looked at him, and the man barely suppressed a curse. The bruise on her cheekbone was covered up with foundation, but apparently poorly, because it could still be distinguished. Or maybe the woman had been crying recently and wiped the cream off with a handkerchief. Whatever the case, Cody wanted to strangle Gareth with her own hands. Is your father-in-law up to his old tricks again? asked Cody sternly. Scarlet absently touched her cheek and muttered, What difference does it make? A big one, Cody replied, you can't live like this all your life. First Justin put up with it, now you, Alicia, are you going to inherit this old man? He's in good health. He'll outlive you all. What do you care? Scarlet repeated louder, it's our life. We'll manage somehow. I want to help, Cody replied simply. And how if Scarlet asked bitterly in her voice, will you kill Gareth and go to jail? Or hire a hitman? I'll buy you a separate apartment, said Cody, it's not hard for me. Apparently he said that last phrase for nothing, because Scarlet was offended by it. Yes, of course. How could I forget, she murmured, you're so easy to buy an apartment. It's only a few million to spend, isn't it? Don't mince words, Cody asked tiredly, I just want you to feel better. Thank Justin for his help, if that's what you want. You always suspect me of self-interest. Scarlet looked at him carefully. And what interests do you really have? I want to take care of you, Cody repeated, you and your daughter and nothing more. Scarlet was silent, as if pondering. Cody opened the door. Get in, I'll give you a ride home. The woman put her bags in the back seats and sat forward. She still looked deeply thoughtful, or even puzzled, as if the very thought of someone wanting to take care of her was new to her. 
You know, even Justin couldn't do anything about dad, Scarlett said, he was too soft, and Gareth wasn't, you saw him yourself. There was never a steady hand in our house. I don't blame Justin. But still, he could have done something to protect you. At least get a separate apartment. We didn't have that option, Scarlett said, Alicia was born weak and sick a lot. As a child, almost all of my paycheck went to her treatment. We had to live on something. Justin worked in one place and another, but he couldn't find anything worthy. You should have come to me, said Cody, I would have found something good for him. After what happened between you two, grinned Scarlett sadly, it was impossible. The car pulled up in front of her house, and the woman smiled. Thank you for your help. And I'm not even talking about this trip or any apartments right now, I guess I just needed to talk to someone. Scarlett got out of the car and froze. Cody followed her gaze and sighed heavily. Here they were. It was clear from the start that this wasn't going to end well. What's going on here, asked Scarlett in a voice trembling with anger, Alicia, I'm talking to you. The girl quickly jumped away from Miguel as if she had been scalded. It looked like Scarlett and Cody had caught them in the middle of a goodbye. Judging by the lipstick imprint on the boy's cheek, this goodbye went on a bit long. Mom, you're a little early today, Alicia replied. No, I came as usual. But you seem to have forgotten a little about the time. Someone promised to make dinner, didn't they? Grandpa's raging again, replied the girl, so I went for a walk. How convenient to blame everything on Grandpa, agreed Scarlet, and this guy must have come at the first call. To amuse you, so you don't spend your time alone? Or did he just want to entertain himself? Young man, would you care to explain why you are here? For the first time in his life, Miguel lost all his eloquence and looked helplessly at his father. Scarlet turned to him, too. Dash, the sun is all over you, she correctly remarked, he found an ordinary girl and decided to turn her head. Why not have fun with a silly girl? They're just dating, Cody remarked, there's nothing unusual about that. Remember yourself. That's exactly what I remember, Scarlet nodded, I remember being a fool who fell in love with you. Let's get out of here, she shouted at her daughter, I'll talk to you at home. I'll call you, Alicia promised, looking at the boy in frustration. I'll call you, Scarlet mocked her, you're so silly. You'll be sorry you ever got mixed up with that family. You forgot your things, shouted Cody as she headed for the driveway. Scarlet returned for the bags and gave the man a look that made him want to fall to the ground. Scarlet and Alicia entered the house, and Cody looked at his son. I guess I'll tell you the same thing, the man muttered, we'll talk at home. Let's go. When they returned home the mood was one of mourning. Miguel did not wait for the accusations and was the first to speak. I ruined it for you, Dad, didn't I, he asked sadly. Me, wondered Cody, I think you hurt yourself in the first place. Scarlet won't let you anywhere near her daughter. But she won't keep Alicia at home forever. This isn't the Middle Ages. You're an optimist. We'll see. It'll be harder for you, said Miguel, that Scarlet looked like she was going to kill us both. I'll get over it, said Cody, it's not the first time. Actually, he was sad, though. The man himself couldn't tell why he and Scarlet had just begun to talk normally and it had all gone to shit again. Footsteps were heard on the stairs. Father and son looked at each other in surprise. Who's that a wondered Cody, did the housekeeper stay late? It's probably the mother, Miguel answered grimly. It seems that her director is having a creative crisis and has decided to return to her native harbor. Where everything is simple, easy and familiar. The guy was right. Nellie was coming down from the second floor, swaying slightly. She seemed to be deeply intoxicated. My boys, she said, with tears in her voice, and I was waiting for you. Where have you been? And where have we been all these last months, or even all these last years, have you ever wondered, said Miguel sneeringly. Of course. What are you talking about, son? Surprised Nellie, I've always loved you. It's just that growing up is very difficult. 
Sometimes you have to make sacrifices. So I never made time for you. Simply put, you sacrificed me, Miguel muttered. Nellie burst into tears. The boy grimaced, Mama, don't put on a show. I already believe you learned a lot from your director. Thank you. Cody rushed to intervene before his ex-wife became hysterical. Nellie, why did you come, he asked, I thought it was over between us. You only imagined it, Cody. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? We've been together for years. Raised a son. And you want to ruin it just like that, just to end it all? Cody was about to get into an argument with her, to say that she was the one who had ruined their family, but he suddenly realized that Nellie was right. Yes, I do, he said firmly, our story with you is long over, and I don't even want to remember you. Shall I call you a cab? The woman looked at Miguel helplessly. He nodded. That would be better. Mom, you didn't need us before. And now we've just learned to cope on our own, we're used to it. Tears streamed down Nellie's cheeks. She shifted her son's gaze to her husband and muttered, All right, I'll go. Forgive me, the woman left the house and quietly shut the door behind her. Miguel sighed. I don't believe this will last. In a month she'll be here again. Then we'll think about it, Cody reassured him, now you have to decide what to do about Alicia. What can you do here, Miguel asked, an enchanted princess is usually stolen from the castle. It's the same principle here. At that moment, Cody thought his son was just joking, though he had no idea what to do. The next day, however, it turned out to be much more serious. Cody got up with a sore head, even though he hadn't seemed to drink in the evening. He hadn't touched a drink in months. Not since he'd gone through surgery. Miguel didn't show his face from his room. Cody decided that his son had still made up for his grief with alcohol, so he didn't bother him. But closer to two o'clock he felt uneasy. Even on a day off, it was simply unseemly to sleep that long. Cody tried to call Scarlett, but she would not pick up the phone. No surprise there. Probably his number is on a woman's blacklist. However, by about four o'clock Scarlett called herself. The woman did not do without any greetings and polite ribbons, immediately asked, Where is my daughter? Alicia, Cody asked bewildered, how should I know? Why are you asking me that? Because she's not home, replied Scarlett, I've called all of Alicia's friends, but no one knows anything. Her best friend told me she hasn't seen my daughter in two weeks. And Alicia was always saying she was going to see her. So she lied. And all because of your son. Wait, Cody guessed, you think Alicia is with Miguel? It can't be true. He hasn't even left his room today. Still, hesitated Scarlett, you know, I can certainly seem gullible, but not to that extent. Wait, said Cody, I'll check it out. He went up to the second floor and knocked on his son's room. Then he opened the door. The curtains were drawn and it was as dark as a closet. The man approached the bed and pulled back the blanket. Well, Scarlett asked, is your son there? No, Cody admitted with a dropped voice, I have no idea where Miguel is. Scarlett cried after these words. She didn't throw tantrums like Nellie did. Cody could tell by the way the woman sniffed her nose. I'll be sure to find him. I'll call Miguel right away. Just wait a little while. However, Cody's good intentions were not successful. He called his son once, then again, but all his attempts ended with the phrase, the subscriber is out of range. Cody began to panic. He didn't believe anything bad had happened to Miguel, but he guessed the rage Scarlet would go into. He's not picking up the phone, but I'll call Miguel again and again. I promise. Please let me know if you hear anything, Scarlet asked him, I'll be waiting. To Cody's surprise, she was no longer swearing or accusing him of all the deadly sins. The woman seemed to be crushed by grief. She just didn't have the energy left. Cody called his son a few more times and began to get angry. Silly boy, he thought to himself, he's an adult on the passport, but he's not smart. Whose fault is that? 
probably my fault. I was always away at work, and I lost sight of his upbringing. It was beginning to get dark outside the window. Cody was already thinking about taking the case to the security services and investigating the whole town, when Miguel showed up himself. His call was like a bolt from the blue for his father. Miguel. It's you, shouted Cody, grabbing the phone, where did you go? You know what I'm going to do to you when you come home? I'm not the only one. Scarlet's going to add to it. Dad, I'm sorry, the son mumbled, this happened, Miguel's voice was faint, as if it came from somewhere far away. It was very reminiscent of the time he had been beaten by a school friend. Cody's anger vanished at once. He was terribly frightened. Miguel, where are you, the man shouted, what happened to you? I'm fine, answered Miguel, I'm at the hospital in the center, I don't remember the number. If you're okay, why are you in the hospital, asked Cody, I don't understand anything. Because Alicia is unhappy, replied Miguel, Dad, come quickly, if you can. Cody immediately got ready, then he stopped by Scarlett and told her everything. The woman clutched at her heart. Dash, I knew this was going to end badly, she said in a sad voice, you've always brought nothing but trouble into our lives. Don't get so upset before you know it, Cody asked, we don't even know what's happened yet. He himself, however, felt a heavy feeling in his heart. Miguel wouldn't make a fuss over nothing. That meant that things were very, very bad. They found Miguel in the hall of the hospital. He was sitting in a chair, his arms around his head. At the sight of his father the boy jumped up from his seat. At last. How good of you to come. Maybe together we can work something out. First tell me what happened, said Cody, all I got from your phone call was that Alicia was in some kind of trouble. No details. Yes, trouble. It was my fault. I picked Alicia up from home in the morning and we went for a drive around town, stopped at a cafe, then walked downtown. And toward evening I wanted to take Alicia home, but she said she didn't want to. She said she barely made it out of the apartment and that her mother definitely wouldn't let her go a second time. So I called a friend of mine and asked if Alicia could stay at his dacha for a while. He said it was okay. We drove to the country, and on the highway we had an accident. A drunk guy crashed into us and it hit Alicia's side. Nothing happened to me. It was all my fault. Scarlet cried and covered her mouth with her hand. Miguel turned to her. Forgive me if you can. Alicia was in the ICU. She had been in surgery for three hours. Scarlet, Cody, and Miguel were sitting in the lobby of the hospital silently. After a while, the boy asked for the tenth time, Dad, what else do you think can be done? Who could we offer money to? Can we find another doctor? You just have to pray, Scarlet replied muffled. That's roughly what the mustachioed surgeon told them as he came out of the operating room. Miguel immediately rushed to him with questions and asked if Alicia needed any organ transplants. I'll do anything, he said. I'll even give you my heart if you need it. Don't talk nonsense, young man, the surgeon said wearily, better go and put a candle for health. I've done everything possible. All that remains is to wait. They spent the next hours, and then days, entirely in the hospital. From the outside, they must have resembled a family of grief-stricken spouses and their unhappy son. Cody comforted Scarlett. The woman was exhausted from crying. And if Miguel said anything, it was I'm sorry, which he now addressed to everyone. Scarlett eventually even softened and didn't look at him with such anger. It must be my fault, too, she whispered to Cody, I forgot my youth. You were right. How can you forbid something to someone who's in love? You can't, the man agreed, it won't do any good. That day, when Alicia came to her senses, was forever etched in the memory of Cody and all those present. His son repeated his endless, I'm sorry again, but this time in Alicia's room, kneeling beside her bed. The girl looked at Miguel with such love in her eyes and everything became clear without further words. Cody pulled Scarlet into the hallway, Dash, let's get out of here, he whispered, visit your daughter a little later. They left the room and stood by the window. 
The woman looked hesitantly at Cody. Are you telling me that after everything that's happened, Alicia doesn't want to see me? Don't talk nonsense, the man replied, I'm sure she does. Our children are grown now, they've grown to love each other. They don't need us as much as they used to. No one seems to need me now at all, muttered Scarlett, I'm old and outdated. Don't talk nonsense, said Cody softly. Yes, the woman asked bitterly, who do you think I am? Instead of answering, Cody simply put his arm around her. Scarlet hesitated and laid her head on his shoulder. The sun was rising over the city. In the saddest place in the world, in a place where sorrow and tears usually reigned, two happy couples had been born. And a year and a half later they were together again picking up Alicia from the hospital, but this time from the maternity hospital. Happy Miguel embraced his beloved wife and looked at his newborn son with admiration. Now we're grandma and grandpa, grinned Scarlett as she held her grandson in her arms. What wonderful years, smiled Cody and kissed Scarlett on the cheek, we're still young at heart and don't forget, we're going to our marriage registration tomorrow. I hope you haven't changed your mind. No, I haven't, Scarlett looked intently at Cody and ran her hand over his graying head, I agree to be your wife. An amazing story, isn't it? Thank you for listening till the end. I sincerely hope that you truly enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and rate this video. See you in the comments and in new releases.